Sam. Okay, I think we're all ready. Oh, Andrew and. So did everyone give a give a thumbs up if you heard that? Be muted unless you are speaking. Okay, first off, we have a proclamation that we will read here in the room. We had one the other day and we have another one today. Okay. This is a proclamation of the Board of County Commissioners of Pitkin County, Colorado, recognizing National Telecommunicators Week. Whereas emergencies can occur at any time that require police, fire, or emergency medical services, Pickin County Reg Regional Emergency Dispatch Center 911 dispatchers are the first people to receive these calls from the public in a crisis, including managing calls from the public about the COVID-19 virus in our community. And whereas Pickin County Emergency 911 dispatchers are CPR certified and specially trained in emergency medical dispatch. They must deal calmly and efficiently with all emergency situations, ranging from horrific calls from an automobile accident or plane crash to medical emergencies and dangerous law enforcement situations. And whereas Pickin County Emergency 911 dispatchers are the single vital link for law enforcement, EMS, and firefighters responding to an incident. By monitoring their activities by radio, dispatchers provide first responders with real-time information that can keep them safe as they respond to calls for help. And whereas our Sheriff and Board of County Commissioners elevated the status of 911 dispatchers in Picking County to first responders on October 10th, 2019, the first in the state of Colorado to gain that recognition. And whereas Picking County Emergency 911 dispatchers were recently awarded the 2020 Colorado Communication Center of the Year by our national professional organizations for leading the way in advancing our status as first responders for advancements in the technology we use to serve our citizens and for maintaining the high level of professionalism and skill that has defined our center for years. All while sharing our process and expertise with centers across the state and the nation to help them succeed as well. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners is proud to honor all of our 911 emergency dispatchers and recognizes April 12th through April 18th, 2020 as National Telecommunicators Week in Picking County, Colorado, dated this 14th day of April, 2020. Thanks, Brett. <laughs> Good job. That's a pretty amazing Thanks, job. Um, is, so, is, he, is he there? Does he want to say anything? Brett, um, would you like to make some comments to all of us here? Sure. Um, you know, thank you. It's a, it's a great honor, and uh, all the credit goes to the dispatchers um, who worked through all of these great technical changes that we had. Um, some of the things that... Um, Got us this award. We were the first in the state and the second in the nation to allow satellite devices to communicate directly to our comm center. Um, we also worked with FEMA to um, allow us to broadcast picking alerts basically um, into Garfield and Eagle County in the Basalt area for the Lake Christine um, burn sky. We were worried about flooding, uh, which will continue on into this summer and probably many more. Um, and, you know, all of those things, the dispatchers had to learn how to use that technology. They had to execute it when they needed it. And, um, and all the time, they kept up the level of excellence. So we uh, brought in a third-party quality assurance group this year, and um, they said that we were the highest-performing center, a new center, to use their, their service uh, 
um, that they've ever seen across the country. Um, also, our medical uh, dispatch, uh, we quality assure all of those calls, and uh, we obtain the rating of uh, Center of Excellence through that, uh, <clears throat> um, our third-party quality assurance company there. Um, and, you know, we had six life-saving awards over the summer. We delivered a healthy baby over the year. And uh, busy. I, I just can't say enough about how how great everybody performed, of course. You know, in our, our normal of uh, being short-staffed, um, they just rose to the occasion every single time. And uh, I'm really proud of everybody, and I thank you guys for, uh, for honoring us in this way. Um, and now it's, it's demonstrated even more um, with the, the COVID response, their dedication. Uh, they can't work from home. They have to go in. They have to be in close quarters. Um, and every day, you, you kind of wonder if uh, someone's going to come in and, and spread it through half of our staff. And um, But they, they persevere and um, are, just, are just excellent. The, the community in Pitkin County is lucky to have uh, this crew. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Brett. Thank everybody for us. Do any other commissioners want to comment? Give pass some words on to Brett. I think uh, congratulations are in order on the the award, getting the top honors for. I don't know if it was for the whole the whole state <coughs> or for the whole country. It, uh, it's, uh, that's Just really the state awesome. this time for the state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that yeah that was really awesome. That and you that was really well deserved. We have a really great crew, and thanks to you, it's um, we're getting this recognition. Thanks, George. Patience again, echo echoing Steve's comments. My my question is, uh, I just caught uh, that that last little bit of your uh, comments saying that uh, you your staff is working in close quarters and hope, hopefully that no one is going to get sick. So I'm a little concerned by that comment in terms of close quarters. Are you not able to have social distancing? Not in the center, no. Um, we've done some things to, uh, to mitigate as best we can. Obviously, we locked down the center. We only allow dispatchers in there. Um, where, the way our consoles are set up, uh, everybody has an assigned console, so there, there's not a lot of cross-contamination. Um, we self-monitor um, as much as we can, um, and luckily, so far, um, we haven't, we've had a few people out sick, but they haven't brought it into the center. And, um, you know, that's, that's the best we can do. The, the way technology is, we're not quite there. Um, as soon as we are, we're gonna we're gonna get it, but um, we're not quite there to be able to dispatch and, and work the radio and, and the 911 phones outside of the center at this point. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Hi, Brett. Congratulations, Thanks. and please extend just our greatest appreciation to your whole team. Uh, sure. I think I think cookie delivery can still happen during COVID, so maybe. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I did want to ask because um, you did mention sort of the short staff nature of dispatch and so I wanted to check in and see if you're filling positions if there's people who are looking for really rewarding work on a great team um, that you can put out that call yeah we um, we just started this winter uh, with kind of a an open uh, always hiring uh, situation um, and in fact, in March, we just uh, hired enough people to be up to full staff um, right when everybody <laughs> left their other jobs, and uh, I had a whole pool to choose from. But um, right at this point, we're, we're actually uh, full staff now. It takes about six months to get people up and, and running and on the schedule. Uh, so we're hoping for a big boost um, mid to late summer when we get these people out of training. But... Um, Okay, I'm glad I think we're, we're getting a lot uh, closer and, and better. Um, and all this work that we did this year is, has really helped. <clears throat> um, John? 
I'm sorry, I didn't see Greg saying I should let him go first, but i just say very briefly, uh, Brett gives a lot of uh, credit to, to his staff, and that is well-deserved. Um, but Brett, you've brought amazing leadership, so mm -hmm. thank you, and, and this is a, a great demonstration of that, and this recognition is deserved for your crew, and it's deserved for you, so thank you. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. It's uh, it's weird. I I grew up in Grand Junction and uh, lived here in the '90s and uh, 2000s. And uh, when I went back there, I stumbled into 911. And uh, about a month into it, I I knew this was a passion and uh, something I was meant to do and uh, and really loved. So I'm so excited to come back here and and be able to help. Picking County and, uh, and live and raise my kids. It's just wonderful. That's great. Okay. Um, great. I'll just, I'll just echo uh, what everyone else has been saying. This is amazing. I understand that uh, Colorado has a joint uh, designation process with Kansas. And so I think Kansas actually was objective in their choice of, right. of, of, of Colorado and, and your operation to, to win this distinct with this distinction, which is, which is so great. And I recall we had 911 folks in recently. Um, you guys are always doing such great groundbreaking work. And I think it's, it's an incredible leadership uh, position. You, you put the 911 dispatch system in. And um, I think it's, it's just great. And I um, want to congratulate everybody. I share George's concern and everyone else's, I'm sure, also that the people there stay safe. If there's anything that you need, we can do to help the dispatch center become more, uh, you know, I guess things are changing. These are changing times and we may need to change how the thing is arrayed so that the dispatchers are safe. That's a, that's critically important that we have a, a team that's uh, healthy and able to, to do their jobs. Thanks. If we come up with any good solutions, I'll definitely let you guys know. And, uh, <laughs> it's the top floor of the St. Regis or something, you know, I, will. <laughs> I like that plan. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank thank you, Bratton. We're going to move on with our agenda now. I just realized I didn't right. even say what day it was today. You know, these every day is kind of like every other day during this COVID nineteen time. So, um, yeah. I think thanks it's, everybody. It is thanks, it's Brett. Tuesday. I think thank it you, is uh, Tuesday, April fourteenth. Right now, this is the Board of County Commissioners' work session, continuing on. And now we're getting to our printed agenda. So we have two people from the Colorado Parks and Wildlife here, our, our local well, uh, wildlife officer, Curtis Tesh, and then Matt Yamashita. And Matt, I'm not sure where your office is exactly, but maybe you can introduce yourself some more. So Curtis, uh, we'll pass this on to you to uh, do your presentation. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to just give a quick update on the elk study that is going on within E15 in Pickin County, and then also give a little update on our bear summit that we had hoped to get going already, but it's going to look like it's going to get pushed back um, just because of COVID-19 stuff. So you're familiar with the elk study that we started last year. Um, just to recap, we were able to capture, I believe, 24 pregnant females last year. Um, process is we insert a VIT transmitter, so when they calf, we are able to locate that calf, and then we have folks on the ground that go out and collar those calves um, so we can track their movements and their survivability. Um, and hopefully, if you have a mortality, we are able to... Um, do a necropsy, a field necropsy on that, and hopefully come to a pretty viable solution as to why that particular animal died. So we did lose a lot of our um, study group last year, and so in December we supplemented some of that population with um, capturing and collaring six-month-old calves, and that all went very well. We captured 25 six-month-olds in December, and then this year we were able to capture and collar 40 pregnant females. So the study is in its second year of a six-year study. 
no real data to give at this point just because it's an ongoing study, but just wanted to give you a quick update on that. Um, appreciate all the help from county, landfill, private landowners giving us permission to land our helicopters and operate on their properties. Uh, any questions pertaining to that or I'll go move on to Greg. Go ahead, Greg. Um, uh, so Curtis, yeah, just let me know any info on the mortality of, it sounded like, uh, was it an unexpected amount of mortality on the part of the six month olds or uh, did you anticipate it? And, and just wondering uh, what what kills a six month old elk calf? Is it is it on the highway or is it a predator or uh, and how, how large is a six month old calf just out of interest? So just to clarify, the mortalities we have were in the calves. So we replenished the population with six month olds. Um, we've had a few mortalities of six month olds, but most of them were in the calves is why we replenished them. Um, and you know, any predator mountain lion bears can take down a six month old as well. I wouldn't say it was a foreseen issue, but definitely something that we were able to adapt to and replenish the population. So we had a viable study group. And, you know, if it continues in the next years to come, we'll hopefully do the same, um, capture more six month olds to replenish whatever calves we lose this year, if we lose any. Hey, Peter. Patty. Hi, Curtis, it's Patty. Um, did we hey, have Patty. any, it's nice to see you. Uh, what was the cause of the high mortality rate in the calves? Is that a normal or a um, you know, weather related predator like, like Greg was saying? Based on our field necropsies and what you know we can assess from that, a lot of it was predator induced. No real numbers or anything that we want to give out at this time, but a lot of the mortalities were due to predators. Okay, great, thank you. And hi, Matt. Kelly. Hi, thank you. I appreciate seeing you all today. Um, is there any indication or is there any way to know if that, that mortality is related to sort of separation from the group or the mother? No, a lot of times when, so when the collar goes into mortality mode, it gives off a different signal. It's all GPS locates. We're able to tell exactly where mom and baby are. Um, a lot of times it was right after birth, right after they hit the ground or when they were in close proximity to the mother. And a lot of times, or not a lot of times, but some of the times the mothers were, um, came up mortalities as well. So it's not necessarily that they're, in those instances, were away from the, the cows that caused mortality. Okay, looks like that's all the questions, Curtis. Okay, now we'll move into our bear summit. So we're working on a bear summit for Picking County, which CPW is working collaboratively with Picking County, Town of Basalt, Town of Snowmass Village, and Aspen. And essentially, we've come to the conclusion that the way we've been more or less managing bears conflicts in the past um, hasn't worked the way we wanted it to. So we are working with those municipalities to try to come up with a, a better way of doing it. The biggest response, change in response you're gonna see on our end is we'll be responding a lot quicker. Um, we are setting thresholds for bears in areas, break-ins, trash violation type stuff. Um, and once those thresholds are met, we will respond to those areas quicker in hopes to trap the offending bear. Um, in the years past since I've been here and um, Kevin before me, we've tried to put a lot of onus on the homeowner to you know, manage their trash, lock their windows, lock their doors, stuff like that. Um, there's a lot of people being affected that are doing it right. So if you're locking everything up properly, but your neighbor's not, there's still the potential for your home to be broken into. And so just because that hasn't been working, the educational component of that, we are going to be more proactive in nature rather than reactive and hopefully <laughs> up a long time and get the offending bears quicker. Um, a good example would be we've had some break-ins in Snowmass Village this last week. Okay. 
normally we would, you know, tell the owners to lock their doors because it was open door situations that the bears got in. Um, but according to this new way of handling things, we responded right away. We set a trap and we were able to remove that offending bear within three days um, after it broke into a second house. And since then, you know, the calls in Snowmass Village have gone down. So that's kind of the trend we're hoping to see. Um, it's definitely going to be a, a big effort on all parties involved, um, but hopefully we're, we've been working closely with them and hopefully we can come to a better solution where we can lower these human conflicts. So we were going to have the bear summit scheduled already, but with COVID-19, we're pushing it back. Maybe this fall, if not, um, you know, we might consider this year as a pilot year and then just move it to next spring. And um, that way we have a year under our belt so we kind of make adjustments um, for the bear summit. Kelly? Yeah, go ahead, Kelly. <laughs> Um, well, a bear summit like this is timely every year. So, um, you know, unfortunate if we can't benefit from that this year, but in future years, I know we will. My question is with regards to once the bear is trapped, what the variety of options you guys use are for that bear. So our options are essentially relocating or euthanizing that bear. Um, if it, one of the thresholds we'll have is if a lot of trash cans are getting broken into, um, or unsecured and bears are getting into trash. Once that threshold is meet, that would be a situation where we would trap and relocate that bear. Um, if it's a situation like the one we had last week where they're entering homes, um, where it becomes a human safety factor, then we trap and euthanize that bear. And typically they get to that point, you know, as you know, they're habituated. It's not something that, you know, they just come out and go to right away. This bear came out of hibernation and first thing it did was broke into a house. So it had definitely been habituated in years past. And if it was reloaded, located to a different area, it would have, you know, continued those same behaviors. And for human safety, that bear has to go. Okay. Um, Curtis, I have a question about bears and their dens. Um, I discovered a bear den last uh, early in the winter time, uh, the way my dogs were reacting, there was definitely a bear in there. I kept them from going down in and exploring. But now my question is, once they come out of the den, do they continue to go back and forth into the den during the early part of the, when they come out of hibernation? Yeah, in the early stages, they'll come out. A lot of times we'll see them come out in the winter. You know, they realize there's a lot of snow. It's so cold, and they'll go back in. Um, they will go back and forth for a while before they come out and fully start to forage on things. Okay. We're seeing that a lot of under people's houses. They're denning, um, getting some calls recently about, you know, bears coming out from under houses and going back under. And they just happen to den under there. And eventually, you know, once it warms up here, They'll come out and then move on. Okay. Yeah, the reason I was asking, we've been avoiding going near that location because we didn't want to disturb the bear if, if they're kind of groggy still and if they're still hanging out in that vicinity. And we, we haven't seen the yeah. bear around the house house at all yet. Or we, we rarely see a bear anywhere near our house. We'll see them out in the more wild parts of the ranch. Yeah, it's best to avoid those dens for a while. Okay. Still. Okay, any further questions from anybody? Okay, go ahead and, oh, Greg. Uh, Curtis, I just wanted to thank you and Matt and for, for uh, the, I think the Bear Summit's a great idea, and as Kelly suggested, it's something we could do every, every spring, perhaps, just to get people back on board and up to speed on on what we need to do to solve the human problem about the bears. I don't know if it's a bear problem or a human problem. Maybe it's a mix of both, but uh, I really appreciate you shining a light on all that. And I look forward to it in the fall. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate that, Greg. It's, yeah, it's definitely a human and a bear problem for sure. Um, so, and just to mention too, after we have this bear summit, we hope to do a follow-up meeting every year, you know, get all the municipalities to and how can we address in years to come? Hopefully, you know, we get somewhere in 
these three years, but more than likely it'll turn out to a five or greater year plan. Um, just depends on how things go. Okay. Great. You want to move on to the mountain lion um, regulations now? Yeah, that's going to present on that. Okay. Hi, commissioners. Um, I'm Matt Yamashita. Um, just for for anybody else that that um, <clears throat> isn't aware, I'm the area wildlife manager for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. My office is in Glenwood. Um, I, I'm in charge of the the areas encompassed in the Roaring Fork Valley and the Eagle and Vale Valleys. So, um, used to be in in the Basalt District for several <clears throat> several years. So very familiar with with the local um, happenings. But the, the portion I wanted to present to you, I, I think you all, do you have a copy of the, our, our mountain lion plan, yeah. the, the presentation? Yeah. Do you want me to try to put it up on the screen or do you want me just to walk through? Well, maybe if you, do you, do you want to do the, the share screen thing and put it up on the, each slide while you're talking about it, I think that would be good. That way the public could see it also. Easy. Look at that. Oh, beautiful animal. Okay, is it up there? It's up. Yes. All right. Perfect. Well, I'll walk you through it real quick. Um, this is based off of a public presentation that um, that we we gave uh, over s several. This was actually shared about 21 times across Western Colorado. This this um, mountain lion plan. It's it's our management plan. We're looking to update it, and this particular plan is. Um, this is going to encompass all of Western Colorado, so both the Northwest and Southwest regions for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. Um, our draft West Slope Mountain Lion Management Plan, it includes every single game management unit in both the Northwest and Southwest regions, as I previously mentioned. Um, I'm not going to go through the specifics on how large those regions are or what their, their composition is. You can see the stats on the screen there. Currently, right now, we have a little bit more, I think it's a little, there's some, some weird ones in there, but more than 13 smaller management units. Um, each of those polygons on, on the map on the left there shows the current status, where each of those is managed, the lion populations within those, those areas are managed individually. Um, these, are, these are known as data analysis units. What we're looking to change it to is the map on the right. So on, on the right-hand side, you'll see two polygons outlined in black, one representing the northwest region and the southwest region. We are looking to change those 13 smaller management units into two larger management units. The premise behind this is that we've learned a lot about mountain lion behavior and their ecology, and this change, this, this adaptation, represents the way the mountain lions use their habitat and use the landscape more appropriately. As part of this, um, we're, we're looking to, it's specific to the Northwest region where, where we, we are. Um, each of these regions has their own harvest limits and we, we will go and, and assess annual annually management thresholds. Uh, right now, the way that it's established is that there'll be a harvest objective. So this is hunter harvest we're talking about in each of those regions and that's divided amongst harvest limit groups. So if you look in the Northwest region, there's harvest limit groups denoted as L30, L31, L32, et cetera. The areas that encompass where we're at here in, in Picking County are the, the yellow area that says SMA, that stands for Special Management Area. And there's a, a tiny little purple sliver in there, um, which is, is part of one of the, the harvest limit groups. So in the Northwest region, our, our overall harvest objective is divided amongst these four harvest limit groups. Uh, so, so basically, this the reason this plan is, is around is um, we're we're trying to manage for a stable mountain lion population on a, a much larger scale, but we also want to retain the ability to manage mountain lions on on a localized scale with a little bit of flexibility. Uh, this relates directly to lion ecology, and as more, as we learn more about the species, um, we understand that that the way we've been managing mountain lions is probably not as appropriate as it is should be. So 
So this graph here represents some historic mountain lion harvest in the northwest region. The red line shows what our harvest limit is. That's the, that's the, the threshold, the, the maximum amount of mountain lions that were allowed to be harvested annually in the region. Um, you can see that, that that line is well above the blue line, which is the actual harvest that we've recorded over the years. Uh, this captures about the last 10 years. And um, we've, I mean, while the, the annual harvest has increased over time, it has remained well below the actual harvest limit. Southwest region, same thing. I'm not going to go into detail there since we're in the northwest region. Uh, why are we revising the old plans? Well, the current plans are all from 2004. We generally try to re-update plans about every 10 years, so we're due for a new plan. Uh, the second thing is that, like I mentioned earlier, these, these pre-existing plans, they, they managed mountain lands on a smaller geographic scale, and they had a limited ability on measuring how pop these populations responded to our management styles. Um, this, this is not really super appropriate, and we wanted to have a little bit more of an adaptive approach towards managing mountain lions that um, identified exactly what was happening from year to year. Uh, the new plan gives us exactly that, and it, it helps us to be able to manage for a, a more stable mountain lion population. Um, the, the big thing for it is that we're managing at a larger scale. Uh, we're going to, by managing at a larger scale, it, it allows us to provide a consistent framework across all of Western Colorado, which is how these, these mountain lions are utilizing our state. And it takes all of those individual plans with individual management concepts and objectives, and it, it brings them into one so that they're all kind of unified. So we're moving in the same direction. And, and what we're doing here isn't counter or contradictory to what they're doing in Grand Junction or Meek or somewhere. <laughs> Uh, the way we're the way that we're kind of predicting things is we're utilizing this concept called a resource selection function. It's a model that takes the the landscape, it takes mountain lion habitat, and it it goes and it it shows what the habitat looks like, and it it brings in layers. Um, these layers articulate how deer use habitat, how elk use habitat. Um, they they bring in different layers of of how lions utilize different types of habitat. This is all based on scientific research and scientific literature, and it compiles all of these layers together to show how mountain lions utilize our landscape. And it, based on that, it, it kind of gives us a projection, um, a population estimate, if you will. Um, right now, we're, we're looking at a mortality rate. So uh, on the bottom tab there, you see that it shows a, a total mortality rate, a threshold of 17%. So out of the population that's, pr that's predicted in each of these areas, um, we're looking to not exceed 17% of those mountain lions being killed annually. And this, th this relates to total human cause mortality. Total human cause mortality is just defined as hunter harvest plus anything that CPW, um, that our officers have to administratively remove based on human health and safety. This takes into consideration road kills, or if there's um, landowners or ranchers that, that are trying to protect livestock, all of those human-related mortalities go toward the 17%. So if, if we exceed 17% um, of the, the number of mountain lions in an area dying in a certain year, then we're looking at a decreasing population. Based on the fact that we're wanting to manage for a stable population, we don't want to exceed that. Um, so th this slide specifically talks about, this is again going back to some of the scientific research that, that we've based this plan on, and when it comes to hunting mountain lions, um, hunters, typically they're use, utilizing hounds. Um, there's different vulnerabilities for each of the age classes um, in a mountain lion population, and if you look at the, again, at the proposed threshold on the bottom, this slide is speaking to the proposed threshold for adult female harvest in a single year. So out of the mountain lions that are harvested by hunters, the second threshold that we're, we're wanting to take into consideration is how many of those are adult females, and we don't want to exceed 22% of the hunter harvest being adult females. The reason for this is that there are studies um, that we've referenced that show anywhere from 20 to 25% of the, of the harvest if it's adult female, that that can indicate that there's that we're, we're managing for a suppressed population. Um, when it comes to hunting mountain lions, their vulnerabilities differ, as I had previously mentioned. 
Um, the, the vulnerability, the, the adult females are tip, typically the least vulnerable. That's on the basis that they don't wander as far. Most of the time they have dependent young. They're not wandering as far. Um, it's less likely for hunters to, to find their tracks. Um, it's less likely for them to have larger ranges where it, it, you know, where those tracks or where their appearance uh, pops up in front of a hunter. So we're, we're trying to utilize that as kind of a something that informs what's occurring with the, the population. As far as determining adult female lions and, and how we've determined that, um, we determined that based on, on age, um, aging the, them by teeth. So we've, since 2009, we've been collecting teeth off of mountain lions, off harvested mountain lions. It's um, by, by law, hunters are required to go and get a mountain lion checked after harvest. That means they either have to bring it down to our office or they have to be, have that inspected by one of our officers in the field. We collect a tooth from that mountain lion and we, just like the rings on a tree, we're able to go through and take a cross section and determine the age class of that mountain lion. Based on all of this, we've determined adult female lions are mountain lions that are female of three years of age or, or older or that have shown that they've previously nursed. So th that's where we're basing this, this um, adult female threshold. So this graph here is just showing, uh, it shows kind of two different concepts. If you look at the left left hand side of the, the graph, it shows harvested lions. That pertains to the, the green bars. Um, you can see that over time, the number of mountain lions being harvested within the northwest region of Colorado has increased. On the right hand side, you'll see what the percent adult female was of that harvest. So out of that harvest, it shows the, the red line in there um, that adult female harvest in the population has remained generally below 20, that 20% 20 threshold. We're looking for a threshold of 22% based off of those scientific studies. Re in the region, we really have, have been under 20%, even with an increased harvest um, number of lions harvested, we're still below 20%. Uh, for our, our this, this slide here just pretty much summarizes exactly what I just discussed. Um, the two thresholds we're looking at are 17% mortality. This is total mortality, and that's going to be measured over a three-year average. So there may be some years where there's more lions that, that get hit on the highways um, based on a hard winter and everything being forced down to the valley floors. Um, maybe the next year we don't experience the same environmental constraints. So over a three-year average, we're looking for 17% being our magic number. For the adult female threshold, that adult female in the harvest, that's 22%, and that's going to be measured annually. If we exceed 22% in any given year, then it automatically is going to trigger some sort of a management action that limits the amount of, of adult females that are harvested the following year. So one thing that's going to be unique to us here locally, um, it, this, this is going to be for, for game management units 44, which in Pitkin County, that's the upper frying pan valley and game management unit 43, which is um, everything from Glenwood Springs through Carbondale, going through Snowmass Village all the way up to Aspen there. Um, in those units, we've, we've been documenting an increase in the number of, of mountain lion human conflicts in recent years. We've been working uh, with municipalities, with all these communities, and we've, we've received a lot of concern for public safety. Um, in, this, in this Glenwood Springs Special Management Area, as it's being called, we're going to have a different set of criteria than the rest of the region. In this portion of the world, we're looking at trying to manage for, um, we're, we're actually trying to manage for a more suppressed population based on the fact that right now the, the, the current trends are showing that we're seeing more and more human conflict annually. We need fewer lions um, in order to, to reduce that conflict. Not saying that Hunter Harvest is going to remedy the problem. We're still going to employ all the other the standards that we currently use um, as far as relocating lions, public education, hazing techniques, um, pretty similar to what we do with bears. However, what we have been doing with those, um, utilizing those, those techniques, has not been gaining us any ground. So we're looking for other tools to put in our toolbox. Um, in the special management area, things like the harvest limits, the percent female harvest, total mortality, everything else is going to be a little bit different than the rest of the unit because 
while we're managing for a stable population across the rest of the region, we're not looking for a stable population in these areas. Um, some of the things that we're looking at of employing are, are electronic calls where we have mountain lions that exist near subdivisions or some of these suburban areas and electronic calls provide an ability for, um, it, you know, those areas would preclude the release of hounds to, to tree a mountain lion, can't go across private properties and some of these, these smaller parcels. However, use of electronic calls might enable hunters to call a mountain lion out of those areas to a safe location where it can be harvested. Um, one of the other things is are some additional seasons. So seasons where we already have deer and elk hunters out in the woods, um, enabling them to have mountain lion licenses where they can harvest a, a, a mountain lion during the, the same season that they're out looking for a deer or an elk. Just utilizing what we already have out there as a resource and seeing if that can help us with some of our, our issues. Um, these, all of these techniques are directly in response to human health and safety concerns. The last part of this is just the timeline. Um, so there's an approval process. Um, right now, February through April, we've been hosting meetings such as this and sharing information with the public, with various stakeholder groups, taking public comment. Um, in March and April, that's when we've had the, the online survey available for people to come, go and log on, review the, the draft management plan and provide written comments to us. Uh, those written comments will be captured by our staff and incorporated into the presentation, which is scheduled to occur in June, where we will be presenting this management plan to the Parks and Wildlife Commission. Um, approval by the commission takes, it's a several step process and it, it may take a two or three meetings, um, but we're looking to start that, start down that road in June. So that's the end of, of what I have for the, the, the presentation. So questions, Greg? Yeah, th thanks, Matt. Um, I was hoping you could put up a, a graphic of the, uh, the, the, the the website or the, the survey, the information number, just so people could access that if they happen to see this program. It would be great to publish that if we could, maybe grassroots could. Um, I did have a couple other questions. Just I'm uh, wondering how much of the, the population is driven by elk and deer populations in certain areas are are, are we looking at uh, reduction in mountain lion populations uh, in order to ensure the viability of more elk and deer was that i didn't hear that but i wanted to see i'm trying to understand how that connects so um the first part i'll just uh i don't have a great way of doing it other than just logging onto our, our website um, if people want to provide comment or are interested in providing comment, um, if they log on to, to CPW's website, which is cpw.state.co.us and search for Mountain Lion Management Plan, it'll lead them to, to the right page. Um, there's, like I mentioned, our entire draft plan is there. There's some additional resources and the online survey for them to provide comment. Um, in reference to man management of our ungulate her herds, deer and elk and bighorn sheep, other species, yes, this will this will play a factor into that. Um, mountain lions are one of the predators that that specifically target those those animals. That's not the basis for that's not 100% the basis for where we're going with this. Um, specifically around here, a, a lot of what, what's driving the discussion here is the number of calls that our officers are receiving where people are, are having, they're being impacted by the presence of mountain lions. Um, I think that picture that was on the, the presentation kind of captures it all. And, you know, where that was 10 years ago, that was something outrageous and that was kind of novel. That's kind of, that's the, the new norm for us now. Um, and it's kind of a, a scary norm. So you, I know that locally here, the discussion, we've had lots of discussion about our declining deer and elk herds. This will probably play a factor in addressing some of those concerns. Um, however, it's not 100% the driving force behind it. Uh, Patty, I mean, uh, Kelly, and then, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly first and then Greg. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, thank you, um, Curtis and Matt. I appreciate you both being with us today and you know talking about something unrelated to COVID. So thanks. Um, <laughs> I do. I I do just want to um, ask maybe just the plain speak kind of general big picture um, going.
goal here about what a stable population is and what metrics you use to determine that. Um, you know, I have concerns that the modeling that's being used looking at habitat, you know, habitat layers is means that over time, the more that humans grow and our communities grow, that those layers shrink and shrink in terms of habitat. And so, you know, I think we need to own what our side of it is in terms of growth and how that plays into what the overall goals for a stable population are. No, thanks for that comment. I think that's that's a, a great way of, of capturing wildlife management in general. Um, habitat is, is the kind of the, the big, the, the key word in any type of wildlife management. And so what we're looking at for stable population right now is based off of what we currently have existing on the landscape for habitat availability, for prey availability, everything else. Um, this is the, the number of lions that we have existing on the, the landscape right now. And what the model's projecting is what we're striving to continue, at least for the duration of this 10 year plan. Um, you know, as, as things change, and you had mentioned that we continue to have um, encroachment on wildlife habitat, that's something that's taken into consideration. And obviously that's part of our, our public outreach process, whether it's mountain lions, deer, elk, whatever species it is. Um, you know, our, ex our expectation on ourselves is that we have a, a discussion with the communities and find out what communities want to see um, with regard to, to animals on the landscape. And if that means they want to see more of them, then we have to have the, the discussion of how do we enable that with, um, with less habitat. So, you're right, that, that is a discussion that, that needs to be had and that that's, those are things that need to be considered not only by wildlife managers, but um, by, by all of us. Kelly, follow-up? Thanks, yeah, I, I do have a follow-up. So, you know, looking at the Northwest region, um, you know, our area comes under the special management um, unit. And I'm wondering how, how is this being felt in other urban areas? You know, how is, this, how is Grand Junction dealing with this? Are they not experiencing the same um, interactions and human safety concerns that we are here? Like, it, that doesn't quite make sense to me. So specific to, to the special management area, um, in, in other municipalities across the West Slope, they are seeing an increase in human lion related conflicts not to the same degree or the same consistency as what we've we've experienced here locally. Um, this is a trend that we we've been witnessing for over over a decade. Um, where we are now, where we were a decade ago, is where a lot of these other communities are starting to to see what they're starting to see right now. So they're not seeing at the same level. It, it's still a tolerable level, um, and there there's enough gap in between their incidents that they're not as concerned as of yet. There have been requests by other communities to have their municipalities included in these special management areas. Um, they haven't really passed the straight face test of, of being able to, to show what the, the level of conflict is in those areas. So we're not considering that for any of the, these other areas right now. Um, overall, one of the things we've heard from the public is that people want to see mountain lions. It's kind of a unique thing and unique species in Colorado. Um, they're pretty majestic and noble. And so we want to respond and we want to perpetuate by managing for these stable populations and keep these lions around. We also want to balance that with making sure that people are safe in these communities, especially communities where we've had repetitive um, incidents or occurrences. Okay, and uh, Greg? Okay. I have, I have a- Patty. Yeah, um, Matt, just because we have a, you know, this is on Grassroots TV right now, and. We like to take every opportunity we have to do some public service announcements. What should people do if they're hiking on a trail and they come across a mountain lion? You know, that, that, that's a, it's a really good point to bring up. And I think we take for granted that people either know what to do or that the, the chance of seeing one is so rare. Um, however, it's, it's not nearly as rare as it used to be. If people are coming across mountain lions, um, you know, recognize that the mountain lions instinctively, they don't want to be seen. They don't want to come in, in to, into contact with humans. Um, they fear humans. 
or they should fear humans. So, you know, just give them their space. I mean, there, there's a there's a whole litany of different uh, measures and rules that people can employ. Um, when push comes to shove, your mind, all those things go out the door. You don't remember what it is. If It comes down to two things. If people can give the, the animals space and they can give them the opportunity to avoid people, if, if you can back up and you can give them a clear route out, Nine times out of ten, doesn't matter if it's a mountain lion, a bear, a moose, whatever, they're going to choose the path of least resistance, and they're going to go their own way and allow you to go yours. Um, probably the best advice, probably the easiest advice for people to abide by. Great. Thank you. So you just mentioned three animals that are potentially dangerous to people. Um I have a lot of relatives in Alaska, and they have more moose stories of <laughs> moose stomping people or people going up trees because they get treed by a moose. Um, uh, is there any advice for people who come across moose besides what you gave? What if a moose is being aggressive and coming towards you? Take shelter. Um, <laughs> the biggest difference with, with moose is that they're – they are a species that they, they kind of understand that they're king of the forest. Uh, there's not many other animals or anything out there that picks on them. And so their tolerance level, they don't show fear, really. They, they will tolerate people to the point of where it's a fault. They will allow people to get so close to them that I'm sure you've seen the videos of recent where people are trying to actively pet moose. Um, and they're abusing the fact that these moose behave as though they're, they're tolerant of that. They're not tolerant of that. They, they're, if you had a heart rate monitor on there, those moose are still aversive to that type of behavior. They don't want that to occur. And if you push it, then they're going to, at the end of the day, they're going to defend themselves. And a lot of times that's where, where that, um, it, it, that kind of a response comes out is that people misinterpret the way the animal is behaving um, and they force the situation. So coming across moose, it's one of those situations where, um, Curtis, and he can tell you firsthand that it's not fun getting chased by a moose. Uh, we, we're going to see more and more moose here locally in the valley, and people need to be cognizant of that and understand that, you know, whether it's a predator or a moose or, or even elk and deer, as we start seeing more and more of them um, residing down in town, that we need to treat them as wild animals. Give them space. Give them the, a way out of there. Um, and let's not encourage them to become domesticated. Can I just add something? Howdy. Um, Matt, I want to just add something real quick. When you were talking about the mountain lions and how they, they kind of like to not be seen, um, you know, I, I'm sure you've heard this many, many times, but I swear when you're hiking along, you can feel their presence. You can feel them watching you. Um, and sometimes it's a little, it's, it's a little spooky, but because um, I've been on some trails and I, kn I know that that's their habitat and you just have to kind of keep moving through it. But, um, you know, they, they have a very strong presence. They, they do, um, and they, they have a, a unique position in this world, and, and that's how they survive is by not being seen. I think one thing I'd be remiss if I didn't mention is probably most of the conflicts that we, that we um, respond to or that we get called on have some component in there that's related back to a dog. Um, you know, and, and with our love of dogs in this community, in this valley, um, yeah, about everybody has a dog and you know for the most part most of us are, are pretty good about keeping tabs on our pets but a lot of these conflicts are pet related and us sometimes not being as responsible as we could be in keeping dogs leashed keeping them um, making sure that they're monitored not allowing them to run around on trails in front of us uh, where where we're starting to see a transition is that it's not always a, an unleashed dog on a trail um, where we're seeing the conflicts, we're starting to see mountain lions that are following these food sources, these, these pet food sources, down into town. And just like that picture where that mountain lion was staring at the cat through the window, um, you know, pets can, can still be vulnerable even in your own backyard. So just making people aware of where they live and appreciate the fact that we live in a wildlife, um, kind of a wildlife mecca of sorts, that, that's an important concept that people need to keep in the back of their mind. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Um, Kelly. Thanks. I have another question. So I noticed that the um, take limits are not generally reached year over year, um, and that the management plan offers kind of more alternatives for um, a, bar a bigger harvest. 
And, you know, is, is success getting 100% of that harvest in a year or in a three-year average? Or, you know, are there alternate, alternative actions that CPW plans to take when that harvest isn't, limit isn't met? So the, so the first part of that, the success, um, how we measure success, it's not necessarily by, by harvesting a specified number and, and that if we don't harvest that number, we're not being successful. Um, one of the things that, that we're wanting to do is, you know, we're, because we're seeing an increase in, in mountain lion numbers um, over, over time, without, without an increased harvest, we're not keeping that population at a stable level. Um, we're artificially allowing that that level to increase, and and like we're seeing here locally, um, you know, we we may end up seeing more conflict areas than than we're seeing not. Um, it's one of those those things that it's going to be as you know as I had said during the presentation, it's going to be adaptive in nature, and there's we're we're likely you know we're going to learn a lot of this as we go. Um, right now, we're we're doing this on the best available science. That being said, we know that there's more science in the works. Um, for example, we, as an agency, we have a, a, a project going on in Colorado where they're specifically studying how conflict relates to harvest, and that should inform some of our decision making in the future. That study is not done; it won't be done for for another probably nine or ten years, but it should help us in the future decide whether. Harvest is the the true way that we should be managing these populations, or um, or if there's other alternative methods. We can safely say that right now, harvest alone is not the not going to solve all of our problems. Um, that's where it falls back on on us um, as a wildlife management agency and and us as a community to be responsible about things. That's where we need people to help us help them um, in in managing these these mountain lions in, in these areas. Uh, same thing as with bears and everything else, you know, don't want to sound like a broken record, um, but we're, we're, we're tolerant to a fault where we're allowing animals to do things that they probably shouldn't be, and it gets them into a situation where, where we have to where we take actions that um, maybe aren't, aren't best in the best interest of those animals or their populations. Okay. Um, one question I had, Matt. Was I was at the, the meeting in Glenwood, the public meeting, and he, um, you and the others there had talked about if an er one of the areas in Northwest Colorado is over harvested, that that would not be a problem because the then other lions would move into that vicinity. I think was kind of the thinking behind it. So you're. You're keeping track of the number, the amount of harvest in a much broader area than previously. So, is is that kind of your thinking on tracking tracking the harvest number over a, a bigger area? It is. Um, the difficult thing is is if we we can't manage mountain lions on a scale of how many mountain lions live in Pitkin County. Um, we we already know that mountain lions live on the scale much larger than, than a, a county or, or a valley. Um, you know, they, they utilize these landscapes, and there's a, a lot of times where they'll, they'll travel several hundreds of miles and not be present in a specific county. So we're trying to better represent that, and that's where this concept um, that we're, we're proposing in this plan, you know, there, there are some increased um, harvest allocations in certain areas, and there's areas that may experience an increase in harvest, but likewise, there's going to be other areas that experience a decrease in harvest. It should e even out, and there, um, you know, there there should be some source sink type type response to some of these mountain lion populations, where um, certain populations of mountain lions are, are easier to harvest, and and so you know that's where we'll see an increase in hunter harvest, and those will be replenished by some of these other source areas um, that harbor an, an excessive amount of mountain lions. Okay. And I think there was a lot of angst amongst part of the public who were, were at that Glenwood presentation, <laughs> thinking because in uh, the special management area in the Roaring Fork and the lower Eagle River Valleys was uh, 
kind of targeted towards reducing the mountain lion population seemed to be the, the perception that people gathered from that. So th I think there was a lot of uh, kind of fear and misunderstanding of what you were actually trying to accomplish here. Yeah, and that, that's a good thing to clarify. Um, you know, whenever we, we speak of suppressing a population, suppression is just another word for, for we, we need fewer of them. Um, that does not mean we need zero of them. Um, that's not the goal is not to eliminate mountain lions in this special management area or the Roaring Fork Valley, Eagle Valley. We still we understand their role in the in the system here, and we need mountain lions in these um, these ecosystems. However, we just we don't need as many of them as we're currently seeing or experiencing in, in certain areas. So we we'd like a suppressed population. We want fewer of them. Um, understanding that we still need them here. Okay, Kelly? This will be my last question. <laughs> so um, I guess, you know, I guess my preference would be that management achieve a balance of a healthy ecology. And as opposed to species by species management, how do these all interplay with each other with, you know, a healthy elk population and rare population? What is, how are you guys looking at that from a big picture? So it, it does, you know, I, I had mentioned earlier that um, with with regard to deer and elk populations here, it's it's no surprise. We've been um, touting that for years that our, our local deer and elk populations are significantly lower than what they have been historically. And we're, we're we, you know, as an agency, as a wildlife management agency, we've been working to restore and reestablish some of these populations and at, at least stop them from the, the drastic declines that we've seen. Um, this does play into some of that. Like I mentioned, um, Curtis mentioned it earlier too, where we do have some other ungulate studies, this elk study that's, that's going on right now. Uh, predators was, was one of the biggest culprits as to why we were losing animals. Um, right now, we know the, the number of animals that we've had callers on, the number of, of um, uh, the, the data we've recorded isn't large enough. It's not a large enough sample size for us to, to really truly um, make any claims and that's, that information isn't available for us to use. However, it's something that we, we know, you know, part of this RSF, this resource selection function model that maps this is based on the number of, 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 um, of population, the population of the prey species that are available in those habitats too. So as deer populations go down, as elk populations go down, as we have fewer of those available for mountain lions, that gets um, that, that relates into the concept of exactly how many lions we're predicting that habitat can hold in that particular area. So it, it is tied together. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a new thing for us. It's something we're trying to utilize as, unfortunately, wildlife management, is, it's one giant experiment. It's, a, it's just a test that we test different theories. We try different things. If they work, great. If they don't, then we go on move on to the next one. Um, the second part to that is it's almost always reactive. We, you know, we, we can't foresee what's going to happen in the next 10 years. So we, we have to do it based off of what we know and what we know about how those populations respond. So that's where we're managing things and, and why we're managing things. Um, it's just using what we already know and what we can move forward with. Okay. Um, Patty. Yeah. Um, Matt, I have a, I have a question kind of on a different note. Um, can you just tell me what CPW's efforts might be to work with local governments as far as um, reducing development into the, um, wildlife habitat, and that's another way to reduce your conflicts? Yeah, so we we've, we've been a, a member at a lot of on a lot of different um, community forums and, and and working groups where you know we what the the easy the low hanging fruit one is that we as an agency we're responsible for for um, we're a referral agency for land use comments. So anytime there's any kind of a development proposal with the counties, we provide comment letters that articulate the impacts to the wildlife resource. Um, some of these other forums and these other uh, roundtable groups that I've been mentioning, we, we are a, a part of some of these in the Roaring Fork Valleys, um, in the, the Pickin County area, also in Eagle County. And the, the basis of these groups is talking about the future and what we should or shouldn't be doing as a species, as a human species, with regard to um, whether it's it's uh, development or recreation or how we utilize the the, the landscape. 
um, what our role is in these communities. And our position at that table is to inform what those decisions will look like in regards to, to wildlife management, what, what, how what wildlife will respond to various um, techniques or, or development proposals. Um, what we do is, is purely, we're not a regulatory agency in that arena. We will provide recommendations. Um, I mean, our officers are the subject matter experts on that topic, and they'll provide information on how things are, are probably going to take shape. And we throw it out there. And if people want to utilize that information, then great. That's the, the purpose we're supposed to serve. Great. Thank you. Okay, George. And I think this will probably be your last question. Um, you're on mute, George. How's that? That's good. That's good. Better. Matt, as long as we have you here, I'm going to throw you a curveball. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you're talking about uh, wildlife management and looking at the, the overall ecosystem, um, what, what is CPW's thoughts on the uh, proposed ballot initiative for the introduction of gray wolves? <laughs> uh, I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> No, uh, I mean, we're, as you, you are aware, you know, we're not allowed to take an official stance as a, as a state agency. Um, you know, we, we can't take a stance. We're, we're prohibited by law to do so. We're not allowed to, to try to influence public vote on the, the issue. Um, it's something that, you know, it, it's, it is a wildlife species. It will definitely play a role in our systems. Um, so it's something that we're, we have a, a, a wolf management plan already on the books it's one that was was drafted in the early 2000s was revisited i believe in 2018 and was reapproved by our wildlife commission and we're 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 ready for for managing wolves i mean we've taken that into consideration um however it's something that that we're we're kind of i mean we're we're waiting to see what's going to happen how it's going to happen and a lot of it a lot of the unknowns um, we can't really, we don't really know exactly how that's going to take shape because we don't know, um, you know, how wolves are going to, if, if wolves are going to be placed in certain areas or if they're going to be allowed to move into certain areas or how that takes shape. So um, I, I think people are, are very aware that we've, we do have a pack of wolves currently living in Colorado and Northwest Colorado. Um, and so that's definitely sculpting some of our discussions and our thought process. So are, are you, um, are you, have you been able to tag any of those wolves to uh, to monitor the, the travel patterns? The, in that particular group of wolves, um, that pack there, we have not. There is another wolf that have appeared this past summer and in, in the summer of 2019 over in Jackson County, um, up near Steamboat Springs. That one was a, a previously marked animal um, that we have been able to through the, through our the use of our pilots. We've been able to utilize the the signal coming off that collar and, and track that that animal and that animal is still there. It's not leaving. Great, thanks. Okay, and Greg. Yeah, just quickly, Matt. Um, wh whenever I see any information on enforcement, say of a poaching uh, situation or something like that, it always seems like the, the the fines and all that just seem like a slap on the wrist. If somebody takes an elk out of season, or you know, we have these incidents with with poaching, and I'm I'm just wondering what's the status of enforcement and uh, where are we with, uh, in, you know, uh, either fines for poaching or, or just enforcement of the bear rules here? Some people think we need, I had somebody just write me just now saying, I'm watching this. Why don't we have stricter fines against people who are not behaving properly around bears with leaving the bird feeders out or these things that draw or, you know, attractive nuisances for bears? How are we doing with, with the fine structure and enforcement structure? How big a role is CPW playing in that? or is it up to local law enforcement? Uh, so it's kind of two separate topics. When it comes to um, like outright poaching of the wildlife resource, when somebody's illegally um, shooting a, a, an elk or a deer or something along those lines, um, we do have our, a set fine structure in place. And sometimes, you know, in, in some regards, some people may think that's a slap on the wrist. Um, you know, some of these fines do total in the tens or 20 thousands of dollars. And, and that's, fairly expensive for, for most people. Um, so it, it, there are penalties associated. Uh, the second component is, of that is that there's 
penalties associated with the ab people's ability to, to purchase or apply for hunting or fishing licenses. So that, that also um, is kind of a, a, a different message that reaches a certain portion of the population. When it comes to, to different laws and regulations pertaining to bears, um, such as trash ordinances, those kinds of things, for parks and wildlife, we have some, some of those rules in place. They take the form as, um, as regulations for us. So it's a fairly low level, um, kind of a minor, uh, I guess, law for us. Most of that, that um, onus gets placed back on individual municipalities or counties. And a big part of that is that, it's, um, that those problems and those thresholds vary from one community to the next. So we, we kind of rely on, on the local communities to, to inform what that fine structure should be. Um, our officers don't enforce county ordinances. We can go out and help county enforce that. We can, um, we can you know, find violations and, and relate those violations back to the sheriff's department or police department, whomever, but we kind of rely on them to follow up at, for the enforcement effort there. Um, something that, that may, may take a different form in the future, but you know, right, anything that we have as far as our regulations and our laws as a statewide agency, um, it's something that has to, to be relevant for us, whether it's on the eastern plains of Colorado or the mountains of mountain communities, or it's not a municipal um, by municipality type, type situation. For us, it's something that, that kind of has to fit statewide. Okay, um, Kelly. Sorry, I know I said I was done, but similar to Greg, I got a note from a caller at home. <laughs> and that qu this question um, is related to what, what are our actual numbers of mountain lions in our Northwest region, and then what number reflects a stable population? I don't know offhand. I'd have to go back and look at all the, the different RSF um, model numbers for each of these, these harvest limit groups. Each of them has a, has a different number for them. Um, I know that in the, the special management area, so that, that encompasses game management units 43, which I mentioned was over by Carbondale, Snowmass Village, up to Glenwood Springs, um, 444, which is the other side over by Basalt, um, going up over there south of Glenwood Canyon. 44 is by Gypsum and Eagle, and 45, which is by Edwards and Minturn. So those four units there, in those areas, population is estimated somewhere around that 120, 130 to 150 mark. Okay. Um, Curtis, do you have any closing or further comments that you want to do before we move on in our meeting? No, that's it for me. I, I appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you guys and um, relay some of this information over to you guys. Okay. And the, the last thing I'll pass on, if, if possible, um, you know, as part of any of these management plans, um, you know, we, we really value what the counties have to say about things. This, this affects people that live in those counties. It affects the way we do, um, you know, work with the counties on a lot of the, these management issues. Um, if you guys are inclined, you know, we, we would gladly accept any kind of a letter that, that helps us influence, helps influence what we do and how we, we're doing business in your county. Um, so if you guys have, have the, the time or the means to, to compose some sort of a letter, um, that'd be appreciated. Okay. Good. So um, thank you, Matt and Thanks, Curtis, Matt. for coming and talking with us today. Um, Greg, you guys are so, so verbose today. Greg. <laughs> oh, God. We're never going to get through this. No, no, he says no now. I just want one closing thing. Matt, say hi to your family for me. <laughs> I think they got, jumped They're already off. gone? They probably had another meeting. Oh, he's still on there. Yeah, Matt's still on there. He's the last yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Stay safe and healthy. Thanks. Thank you to you guys. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Greg has, I don't know, he's waving by. He doesn't want to talk. <laughs> Stay on mute, Greg. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, moving on, we're um, John Peacock. I think we should maybe do our special meeting now and then go back to the future agendas. Well, we need John Ely down here, I think. Well, I think John is on. John, are you on the phone? He's here in the building. I'm here. Okay, he's on, he's on the screen. So oh, he's not Yeah, I can see. 
So I will call a special meeting, and this is to consider an, an emergency ordinance with confirmatory hearing on May 13th. John, could you explain this? Um, yes, uh, Steve, this is a matter that the board uh, discussed last week concerning three different trail segments that the county recently allowed um, dogs to go off leash on and, uh, and be under uh, only voice control of their, of their owners. Uh, specifically, those trail segments are the Smuggler Mountain Road, um, Hunter Creek tr um, Cutoff Trail, and the, uh, the Jaffe Park Trail. So what this emergency ordinance does is to suspend that uh, privilege of having uh, your dog off leash on those trail segments um, while the, um, the public health orders are in effect. It's an emergency ordinance, so if the board approves it, it becomes effective immediately and will be set for a confirmation at a, uh, a regular meeting in the future. Okay. Um, let's see. I, I see Gary. You need a motion? Well, um, let's have further discussion first. Gary Tannenbaum is in the room, and I don't know if you were here. Were you going to talk about the, the um, and number of enforcement issues you've had along the trail, especially regarding dogs, or are you here for talking about something else? He says no. He's just in the room. <laughs> Sorry. You can either go to that one or this one. Yeah, well, um, oh, or over, yeah, that whichever. One. Maybe go over there to to John Peacock's area. Hi, I'm Gary Tenenbaum, I'm the director of Pickney County Open Safety Trails, and I'm really here to help answer questions. Um, I did send you guys a ranger update earlier today, and really what we're seeing is it, it is an increase of use we're not seeing an increase of, you know, um, issues with enforcement. Our rangers are still out there. And, you know, yes, we do more limited contacts, so we don't expose the rangers to a, you know, to people that potentially have COVID-19. But, you know, overall, we're seeing more use. And basically, I'm here to help answer questions. I'm happy to see that you're tying this to the public health orders because we're going to have to answer a lot of questions once this goes into effect. Uh, we are making signs as we speak to put out on Smuggler Mountain and to put out on the Jaffe Trail and really to try to get the message out that really truly in Pickin County, all um, um, Pickin County open space trails properties are now under a leash law and um, people need to respect that. Um, so we are going to try to do it as you know, obviously, we're not going to expose our rangers to more contacts, but we're going to try to just be out there explaining why we did this. And uh, on the big, we're making some big sandwich boards for that um, to help to get that message out. Okay. Uh, George? Yeah, Gary, I mean, one of, <clears throat> one of the uh, questions we had was just to get your, your staff's input, your rangers' input in terms of uh, if you think this is necessary, I saw the numbers <clears throat> that you sent to us, and um, just for the public, Smuggler Mountain last March, you had about 7,700 users, and uh, this March you've got uh, 9,300 users, so about 21% increase. The Rio Grande Trail went from about 6,500 users last March to this March, almost 12,000 users. Um, uh, but uh, so I'm assuming that <clears throat> with that increase in users, you're probably seeing an increase in uh, dogs as well. Well, yeah, we're seeing an increase in use overall, and that includes people with dogs. But we're not seeing necessarily a huge increase in violations, especially in the areas that uh, you do have to have your dog on a leash. You know, we're not seeing a spike in that use smuggler is one of those areas, yes, we've seen an increase, but we haven't seen an increase in issues. Um, right now, you can have your dog off leash there, so we haven't seen an increase in issues. Um, so, you know, this that we're not seeing 
big issues going on in the trails. The problem is, is the biggest issues we're seeing is people being able to social distance. And it's really difficult with that many people using we, the trails. People have to be smart. Um, I think one of the things is putting the, the, you know, using these things outside too can help. You know, basically doing it. It's <laughs> kind of hard to know when I should be doing it or not. So the reality is, is this is really important outside, but also being, you know, social distance. And so um, I see where you guys are coming from on the dog piece. It's, you know, it is tougher for people to so social distance when your dog is, you know, potentially moving away from you or to or towards other people. Um, but this will be, you know, we're, we're going to try very, you know, to try to get people to do the right thing to social distance, and we're doing it everywhere. And so that's been the 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 reason why you know we're we're out and about, and you know a lot of our other staff is also going to be out and about, really helping the rangers get that message out, um, because you know this week as of tomorrow, there's places that open up on the BLM, the Crown uh, part of the Crown opens tomorrow, and you know we just want to make sure that people realize that you know you have to social distance these trailheads are going to be crowded and you've got to do the right thing you've got to do it and we're going to be watching and we're going to be trying to be out there far enough away from you but also educating to to really let you know that this is serious um, because it goes into everything else that the county is trying to do to you know really flatten this curve and and really limit the spread so, so just so I could, I think I, <clears throat> for me to summarize this, what I think I hear you saying is <clears throat> we've seen, <clears throat> excuse me, we're seeing a, a large increase in uh, trail use. And along with that, we're seeing more dogs, of course. Everyone's got a dog. And to help emphasize the need for social distancing, uh, you feel, open space feels, perhaps we feel that uh, having a leash law in effect for all of our trails will help uh, ensure, help better ensure social distancing will take place along our trails. Um, yes, to a point. I mean, we just, we were not seeing an issue on smuggler per se, but the reality is, is when you do go to smuggler, you do see a lot of people and the dogs are, you know, they're under control for the most part, but they're, you know, they, they travel beyond six feet of, of humans. So, you know, if we're trying to limit that um, overall, you know, spread and people, you know, really trying to stay away, you know, honestly, you know, the, overall I feel that the Pickin County has been, you know, the leader in trying very hard to do everything in our power. And this is just one more tool in the toolbox to be able to do that. And, you know, the reality is, is Eagle County put on in their public health order. And this really helps kind of mix those two together because Eagle County has a public health order that you have to have your dog off leash, uh, not off leash, on leash as soon as you leave your house. And so when they made that public health order, you know, there is some discrepancy between the two counties on that one. This one kind of clears it up and gives a consistent message overall that, you know, putting your dog off leash helps keep the social distancing. Okay, okay Kelly. I have a question too. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. I really appreciate appreciate all the detail and major shout out to the Rangers who are covering a lot of territory um, with so much extra use. My question is, have you um, been hearing from people at all that this is going to be um, you know that this decision will put out i or have other board members i have not received any correspondence from anyone saying asking us not to put this into effect um i think the article in the paper was the first time that people really heard that this was truly going to happen um but i have not heard anything from the the community or the rangers yet that you know people are upset by this obviously once that sign goes up we'll see what what people say and we'll, we'll probably get better feedback um, when that happens but i think what we're seeing is that you know our rangers are trying very hard to just talk about social distancing overall 
and for the most part, people get it. So this is just another social distance thing. So um, we'll see how it goes, and we'll give you the feedback um, as we see it. We're going to try to do more Ranger updates uh, to you guys just to so you see what's going on out there and uh, and and understand what we're – I mean, because – Right now, it is awesome that we live in a place that we can go out and see and actually go out and enjoy nature and be able to be outside, um, but we've got to do it responsibly, so it's a kind of a double-edged sword. Okay. Greg? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, okay. yeah thanks, Gary. Um, I, I, uh, I know we've all received the letter from the, the family on the Rio Grande Trail who's very concerned about the dogs you know, the neighbors or the, the other people's dogs jumping up on their kids and jumping on them. Um, uh, I have received comments from people who are concerned. If I can read it very quickly, I just received an email. Um, and here's the, the, the uh, question is, um, it says, to me, it seems you all are working to fix a problem that does not exist. Why would the county want to take this one last freedom away when residents, from residents when there has been no known transmission by dogs? and no known problems associated with dogs. This is purely theoretical based on a dog possibly jumping on another human who should be wearing a mask already. Uh, we're doing well to control this. Why do we need this additional measure? So I think we're going to get some of that in the community. Um, yes, it says the dogs can't get this, but I think an animal certainly can carry it if uh, somebody with, a, with a, a severe case of it coughs on a dog and the dog gets petted by somebody else that could be a transmission. It seems to me that pretty obvious that an animal could carry it. Um, and if that's a concern, we should articulate this argument because I think we're going to be hearing this from people who are upset that we've taken away one more freedom and it doesn't quite make sense. So uh, we're already getting that information, those comments. Okay. Patty? Well, I just got a letter um, from someone who thinks we should put cats on leashes too. But we've been through that cats on leash thing discussion many years ago, and hurting cats is one thing, trying to keep cats on leash, except for Cindy Hubin's cat. That cat loves its leash. But anyway, this is from a friend. But um, I think we need to be clear with the public. And, and it, for me, um, and I think Kelly's quotes in the paper, um, this is really about that's that social distancing and the fact that people get too close. You know, especially if you have a puppy, everybody wants to come up to you and pet your puppy. So I, I just... In my mind, I think this is something we need to do. I'm not doing it because I think dogs are transmitting the virus. I talked with vets today, and we had a vet comment. There was comments from the vet in the paper. Until we have more data, and uh, I know Greg is the best one in getting data, so I'm sure he'll find us something, but I would love to read more about it. But in the interim, I'm doing it for the social distancing, but I want people to know that we will have a time frame when we start to reopen things that this is not forever. We're not going to go back to having then people come back to us and have the discussion about dogs off leash. In my mind, it's an interim step because of the coronavirus issue and that we will bring it back at the right time, probably in the summer, early summer, um, and reinstate, you know, just depending upon the status of the virus. But um, and to me, it is not a permanent. It is just an interim having to do with the current crisis. And I want people to know that. And again, um, it's just more about the social distancing. And, um, and, and I, don't, I think we need to do everything possible for that. And I don't think having dogs leashed on these, in these areas for the next six weeks, a month, who knows, is, um, is that detrimental. I think it's more important to, to keep everything under control. Okay, John Peacock. Thanks, Steve. I, I just wanted to note I got some questions yesterday actually about our recitals. I think this is the first time in my career I've gotten a question about recitals in, in one of these versus the outcome. But in particular, it's the recital that says, whereas a, re whereas recent, whereas a recent report indicates that animals, including dogs, may be able to pass the COVID-19 virus along, I, I think the um, in intent there was to reflect the board's discussion about some news reports. I think the confusion was people thought that these were new studies or scientific reports or potentially CDC recommendations. I think since this is part of our official record, I just recommend the board uh, maybe put in some clarifying language, even as simple as 
uh, whereas a recent uh, news report uh, indicated or, or something along those lines, just to clarify um, that this isn't necessarily a scientific uh, uh, study. There, there was some confusion about that. Or check it out. Hey, Kelly. Yeah. They, um, thank you, Patty, for so eloquently summarizing what I see the point of this. I would prefer to remove the sentence that John referenced altogether. Um, I don't think it's, uh, I think it's tangential to what we're trying to do. I too would be more comfortable removing it. Okay, so um, John Ely, do you, I mean, uh, the board, do you want to make the change that John Peacock suggested? It sounds that would be reasonable to me. Right. Um, George, do you have comments? Yeah, just quickly, um, I, I'm hoping that um, that we're only looking at a few weeks versus a few months uh, as we continue to get reports from the Board of Health and from our medical personnel um, looking at how the community is doing that I'm hoping we're going to come out of this situation sooner versus later. So I just want to make that comment. Yeah, and I, I have a feeling that one reason so many people are on Smuggler and the Rio Grande Trail is because it's close to home and with still it being, you know, s snowy and muddy in the high country and some places they can't get to yet, people are maybe more concentrated on the trails close to home that are easily accessible and maybe as the weather continues to get more into spring and summer people will be spread out more at that point so uh, i think i would entertain a motion at this time for patty i'll make a motion uh, to approve an emergency ordinance of the board of county commissioners um, repealing ordinance 01-2009 and 16-2019 and adopting an ordinance prohibiting dogs to be walked off leash along Snuggler Mountain Road, the Hunter Creek tr Cutoff Trail, and a portion of the Jaffe River Trail. And it will, this will include the removal of the paragraph um, related to the recent report indicating that animals, including dogs, that section will be removed. I'll second. Okay, it's moved and seconded to approve with a minor change to the language. And it's coming back for second reading on, I don't know. April twenty. April twenty second. Second, I think. Second. It'll be a it'll be a confirmatory reading, Patty, um, and the date will be consistent with the publication date that Jeanette um, organized. All right, because there's no there's just the year, but no. Anyway, that's fine. So, oh yeah, public hearing on confirmatory hearing on the thirteenth of May. Thirteenth of May. Okay. Thanks, John. Okay. Is uh is there further discussion? Uh, Greg. Uh, Greg, hey, Steve, just um, through the discussion only that I haven't had any comments uh, coming to me regarding any of those those particular areas. The comments that are coming to me are regarding Sunnyside and density of people, not social dis distancing on Sunnyside. I want to make sure we're not driving dog owners to Sunnyside, which would make the problem over there even worse. Just a thought. Is the Sunnyside the least? Is at least I'm not even sure, it's, but it's, it's, it's a service. high dense, high use area. It's forest service. Okay, so maybe it's already leased. They don't. They don't. No, it's not. So, um, so that's a good you point. know, we might need to do some messaging. Um, people, families with young children, and those are the ones who complained about the dogs jumping up on their little kids on the Rio Grande Trail. Um, and I'm thinking that maybe people need to just take their, if they are going out with a stroller and their young kids where people have dogs, those dogs need to be on leashes in those locations. And those people should maybe not be taking their kids on trail, the Forest Service trails where there might be dogs off of leashes. Rio Grande is of leashed. Yeah. I thought you were going to recommend putting their kids on leashes, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> now... <laughs> the one place I saw a kid on a leash was at Island in the Sky in the Canyonlands National <laughs> Park because those people lived there and they did not want their kid going off the toddler to become a casualty falling <laughs> off a cliff. Gary. Well, the one question I have is 
what public health order is this tied to when it goes away? And because we're going to get questions, I mean that's that's the biggest question we're going to get is when does this over? And so, um, you know that that's the question that you know really is going to be the one that we can't answer based on this. So I just want I just if it's not clear, it's not clear. But it's I just want to I, I just want to try very hard to figure out what to tell people for that. Well, I, I don't think it's directly tied, but I think the discussion between us, because it, it's, it's really separate, but I think the discussion will happen at the time we're starting to unwind or, you know, the public health mandates, and then this will come up into that. So it could be, um, be, could be the first part of May, or it could be the end of May, or it could be some time frame in there. We just have to play it by ear. Okay. But we'll kind of try and coincide it, I think. Okay, John Peacock. And <clears throat> Steve, so um, Gary, I think it is a difficult question to answer. Our current public health order uh, runs through April 30th. Uh, on Thursday, the <clears throat> Board of Health is going to have a meeting where they're having a, um, I, I think, a, a more robust conversation about um, when uh, and, and how the public health orders um, might, might start to, to be unwound, but it is likely that several aspects of it um, will be continued beyond uh, April 30th. And so we'll probably have some more clarity, uh, I think, on that question towards the end of the week or going into next week. And that's, that's all I needed. I mean, basically, I just wanted to be, you know, you're tying it to the public health orders. So that's a good way for us to message that that you know that these are tied to it and they will be revisited as the public health orders are being revisited so that's fine okay um, I, and steve gary i was just hoping that uh on the signs you're doing there's enough of an explanation so people really get a sense of why we're doing this when they read the signs you put up so they understand where we're coming from um as succinctly as you can i know that's not always easy but just so um, they understand what this is about. And I think that would be really useful. And so, yeah, Greg, we are, we're putting it on there that it is, I mean, we're putting it on there for the social distance piece. And so, you know, because, um, you know, that is the biggest piece. So it's going to be on the sign, you know, the, that's going to be due to, we created an emergency ordinance by the BOCC to protect people for social distancing and so that's going to be on there um, so people see it, that it, we're serious about the social distance piece. Great. Okay. Uh, any more comments? George? Yeah, John, this is a little unusual. This is, I think, perhaps the first time we've gotten in front of the uh, Board of Health in terms of uh, putting together a special order. That's not that's not a, going to be an issue or problem with the Board of Health. This isn't I'm I'm about. not sure which uh, which John you're talking to, but um, John, really the 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 leash law um, for Jaffe Park and Smuggler is really the purview of the Board of County Commissioners, mm -hmm. and this is something that the Board of County Commissioners um, had discussed at, at your last meeting and and given staff direction on. I think it'd be a different profile potentially if you were trying to approve it as part of the, the public health order. But I think you're taking action, frankly, on, on something that's in your purview, whether there's a COVID crisis or not. Okay, thanks. Okay. I don't know if that is to me or John Ely, though, so I <laughs> hope I didn't step in. It worked. Okay, any further comments? Call the question. All in favor, say aye. 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 Or give a thumbs up. <laughs> aye. Any opposed? I didn't hear all the answers. Okay, I think we're unanimous in that. So thank you, John Ely is already. Oh, you're still on there. Okay. Um, and uh, I think that's everything for the special meeting. We need a motion to adjourn the special meeting. So moved. Patty moves. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All in second. favor? Aye. Say aye. 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 Okay.
We are out of special meeting. Um, let's go back to our review of future agendas. Thanks, Steve. I just have a, a couple of things um, to, to get direction from you all on. Uh, in, in relation to the next Wednesday's meeting, uh, the board has conducted uh, two reappointment interviews uh, for the P and Z. That was uh, Jeffrey Woodruff and Chelsea Clark. Um, if the board is prepared to, to give direction on those uh, reappointments, we could prepare and add a resolution in, in the next week's agenda. Uh, if that's something that the board is prepared to discuss. Well, now. Okay, Patty. I don't know if we have any other, if we're still open for applicants or is it closed or, you know, we usually have a time frame. Yeah, we, I, my understanding is we have closed and that there are no other applicants okay. at this time. Okay. Uh, George? No, I'm, I'm good with that. Okay, you're just doing a thumbs up. Okay. Yes. I, I just have a comment about, yeah, you know, um, about Chelsea. Um, I, I've heard from through other members of the PNZ that she made some very clear comments about affordable housing that are a little concerning to me, saying that we don't we don't need it. We should just get rid of the whole program. Um, and I, and I, I just think that's interesting. Uh, she didn't really. I, I haven't spoken to her about it as to why she made that comment and you know what what's you know causing her to think that way. But um, you know. It, with our emphasis and our goal for affordable housing in this community, um, it's just kind of ironic. We have somebody sitting on planning and, Z, planning and zoning who doesn't think we need it and thinks we should get rid of what we have. But um, I, I just was not comfortable with that. Okay. And it doesn't hurt to have a diversity of opinion on the board, certainly. No, no, no. And I'm, not, I'm just saying yeah. I don't know what the, the background on that. Yeah, but that, that is a little bit interesting. That's a pretty strong, not we need to modify, community. but we need to get rid of the whole program. I'm like, you know, so. Okay. So uh, a thumbs up from everybody. I, we didn't hear from you, I think, Kelly, that about approving the, well, there's that the board. two yeah. people for the P and Z reappointments. Okay, you good yeah, with that? I'm good. Okay, I think we're all good with that, John. George? Well, I, I, I had not heard that comment uh, about Chelsea, except for right now. So I would be a little concerned if that was, uh, unless that was taken out of context, you never quite know. I don't know if somebody wants to just follow up with that question, because uh, that would be a, a bit of a concern for me. Yeah, I, I would I, just still review the notes. Um, because what I heard is that her concern was that our requirements in ComDev such that to build an affordable house um, is difficult for people to do because of the exactions and requirements that we have in our land use code. So I I I think because I think I would be more comfortable holding off on appointing her and, and I'll give her a call and clarify that. Okay, so. If that's okay with the board, uh, so I maybe, think it's important. Maybe we should review her comments on the tape. So It wasn't what, something I, she said as part of her interview. It was something that came along at one of the PNC Yeah, because Kelly, I think you hit that accurately. She, she I do remember her commenting on the affordable housing, but I think maybe the Comments are being taken out of context with what she was actually saying, but maybe we should take the time to, to review that. And uh, that would just, you know, put it off a short while. Um, and I don't know, should we go ahead and reappoint Jeffrey Woodruff to the, his position in the meantime or wait? I would reappoint Jeffrey and, and, and I'll give Kelly, I mean, I'll give, Ke I'll give Kelly a call. I'll give Chelsea a call as soon as I can. Chelsea, okay. And I'll bring it back to the board. <laughs> okay. Okay, is that anything else on that, John? Uh, not, not on that item. I just note um, next week's agenda is obviously uh, very light right now for the, the work session. Um, we're, we're just showing exec and board reports. Um, obviously, we'll probably have some other things to, to talk about, so I'd recommend leaving that um, 
agenda on, and if it's a short meeting, it'll be a short meeting. Okay. Kelly? Kelly? Um, if John, I have a request. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, I would really like us to, to talk about perhaps the different opportunities that are within our um, county authorities in relation to our COVID response. And, you know, some of the things I'm, I think that has come up in prior conversations were like vested rights, an extension of vested rights, and maybe a list of other things that we could consider to help um, our community rebound from this recovery or from this response. Um, perhaps a oh, way yeah. to start is to look at what was done in the 2009 recession. I understand that we had, had conversations about what we could do to help alleviate um, economic impact in our community. And, you know, I would like to see us having that conversation sooner rather than later so we can, you know, provide either some direct decisions or weave that into our plan for recovery. Okay. Sorry, I was writing down. Okay. I wasn't, was sure I wasn't hanging my head. <laughs> um, okay. And John, do you have any other? Uh, George? Yeah. Yeah. We, we received a letter um, from uh, an adjacent landowner for an upcoming land use application. I think it's a subdivision of Bob Oxenberg. And the, uh, the letter, the. Um, the neighbor was asking us to postpone that hearing until he was he, he's out of out of out of state until he was going to be able to be here in person to make his comments and i would just uh, um, reply to him that he has the opportunity to make those comments via uh, uh, teleconferencing just like we're doing which is just as effective as being there being there in person and that we're going to continue to keep uh, county business moving along, but it does not deter anybody from uh, their ability to make public comments to us. Okay. Yeah, uh, George, I forwarded that letter. I also spoke with the with Linda, who wrote it, um, and I forwarded it to Cindy Hoopin. She's been in contact with her, letting her know how they can participate, the time frame, and the methods. Um, and so yeah. Linda was thankful. So that we've we've already taken that into consideration and. We don't know when the second reading will be, or if there will be. So, um, so Linda, Linda, they know. Linda and Marty know how how they can participate. Good, thanks. Uh huh. Um, commissioners, any other commissioners have uh, future agendas? I have one item. Um, I usually do, but again, we just don't know what the future agendas might bring in the future, so I'm going to mm -hmm. hold off until we get some more concrete information. We're, we're being very nimble. <laughs> um, there's one land use item that is not on the future agendas, but it, the property has been posted for the, the commissioner's meeting and public hearing, and that is on the May 13th meeting. Um, a regular meeting and it's bare at door which is the former child ranch uh, so it's my neighbor doing a la his land use application it's not listed on there um, a couple of considerations on uh, John maybe you could follow up on it the sign that is posting the meeting lists my address as the address for the application so the public notice sign is incorrect because it's not <coughs> my application. They put my home address <laughs> on it. So this showed up yesterday, um, was the first we saw it. I don't know, maybe it was there. It was probably posted yesterday. And I don't know what the posting period is, but it's incorrectly posted. So uh, when they get it correctly posted, I think that would be when the when the posting the official posting date is and that would then determine when the hearing could be held yeah we'll we'll let calm dev now i think uh john neely dropped off unfortunately yeah, but on. um we'll we'll definitely look at that steve thanks okay 
Um, any other, any other um, future agendas? I don't think there are any. So moving on to uh, open discussion items. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button there for a second. I've discovered virtual backgrounds, by the way. There's know, lots of fun. Cool. You can be all kinds of great places while sitting in your home or office. So um, how, uh, yeah, we all want a lesson how so, to do that. Yeah, can anyone guess where I am? It looks like you're at the, is that the where is that? Buttermilk. It, it's actually reversed. It's a, a ridge off of Sam's Knob, uh, overlooking uh, towards Mount Daly and such. <laughs> I was going to say the Verona Mallory overlook. <laughs> What's that? Well, I was going to say the Verona Mallory overlook. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> there, we'll, we'll have a little uh, ge Picking County geography, uh, maybe each uh, open open discussion. Um, wanted to update the, the board on a few COVID-19 uh, items because that uh, seems to be what we talk about the most uh, these days. Um, you should have gotten the report from April 13th in your email. Uh, just for the public, I'll, I'll highlight a few numbers that uh, Aspen Valley Hospital um, currently has two patients. Um, there are 1,312 patients hospitalized in Colorado. Um, we've been getting Valley View numbers uh, one weekend. Uh, so this, this report did not have the, the Valley View numbers on. Um, we have 34 uh, confirmed positive tests. If folks are looking on the CDPHE website, they have started including a number of presumptive positives. So their numbers may look a little bit different um, from, from ours. And, and we're working to get that uh, reconciled, how they're making that determination. So just so you know, there, there may be some uh, differences there. We're using those who, who have tested. Um, and while tragically we've had two deaths, um, fortunately we've remained at that number uh, for, for some time. I want to, uh, um, I, I shared with the board uh, over a weekend, I'm going to try and uh, share. Are you all seeing my screen now? Yep. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, Unicast is a website that has been grading states and counties on how effective um, our community has been um, both with the, the social distancing policies, but I think more importantly with how our community has responded and it's using uh, cell phone data and, and mapping data to, to provide some metrics and provide a grade um, to states uh, and counties. And I just note that uh, Colorado is right now, and this changes every day, I was more excited when I saw this the first time because uh, we, we were a little bit higher up, but Colorado is rated as a B minus. But out of 3,007 counties, of course it's going to hang up now. Um, in the United States, you'll see two Colorado counties that have been trading places for first and second in terms of the effectiveness and adherence. Um, to, to their social distancing, and that's Summit County and Picking County. Now, the first time I looked at it, Picking County is in first place, and I wanted to put that up, but <laughs> as the, the data has been uh, changing, um, Picking County, since we have put our public health orders uh, into effect um, by this website's measurement, um, has been among the, the top counties in the nation in terms of what our community is doing uh, to, to achieve social distancing. And what they're really looking at is um, what's happened uh, with um, uh, mobility, you know, and we've seen based on their cell phone data, a 70% uh, reduction on distance traveled, 70% uh, a greater, I'm sorry, greater than 70% reduction in mobility, a greater than 70% reduction 
in non-essential travel um, and greater than 94% decrease in encounter density, how many cell phones are, are gathering uh, in, in a place. And I think that um, that speaks well um, to how our, our community is, is responding. Um, of course, on the other side of uh, the public health orders and our community's efforts to achieve uh, social distancing in order to, to fight the pandemic um, is the um, economic uh, kind of impacts and such that, that our community is experiencing. And I just want to um, give you an update uh, where we are uh, with our emergency assistance. Um, I believe last week I told you our goal um, was to get to 75 to 100 approvals a day. Um, our team has been really flexible and they've made a lot of changes uh, over the last week, both in process and staffing. So over the past week, we've actually moved 32 employees from other departments. Um, so the library, the clerk's office, a, a number of other departments and train them to both conduct and approve uh, aid for our emergency assistance fund. Um, that we are just now starting to, to bring those folks online in, in that com combined uh, process. Yesterday was our first day um, after we trained those employees um, to, to have a full run uh, with them. Uh, we were able yesterday to approve 60 applications uh, in one day and we're targeting 80 to 100 applications today. So we're really starting uh, to, to hit our stride there uh, and, and get those dollars on the street. And I, I think you all can be really proud um, of how the organization has been flexible um, and, and really worked to, to try and up our capacity there. Additionally, we're working with our municipal partners to add additional staff who will be dedicated to this um, approval process. I, I know both Aspen and Snowmass have identified uh, employees that will be able to participate on that. And so going into this next week, we hope to have 40 trained staff uh, doing that. So um, thank you uh, to our departments. Uh, and, and to our uh, municipal partners. Additionally, um, we've streamlined our process to get uh, W-9s uh, quickly approved um, so that applications can move forward. We've moved away from issuance of cash cards, which is how we had been providing uh, the uh, assistance. Uh, we've put a new process in place uh, with finance um, where we're working to get uh, once an approval is made to get checks out within 48 hours. Again, that's a new process. We're going to be getting measurements on our first runs of those uh, this week to see how we're doing on that turnaround time. Um, and, and we'll make improvements as necessary. Uh, we are still giving cash cards um, for emergency assistance to our undocumented individuals who otherwise uh, may not be, be meeting the requirements to get a, a check. Um, and we are working directly with landlords of undocumented and, and issuing checks uh, directly to landlords. So a lot of exciting things uh, happening there. Um, and these numbers are, are going to start to um, change pretty quickly um, now that we have our, our staffing model and, and such in place. But we have approved now 359 applications, um, assisting 652 individuals. Uh, the average age right now is $968. Um, again, these you're going to see these numbers starting to move much more quickly now that we have that capacity uh, in place to, to really start um, uh, approving uh, those, those applications. Um, our funding right now is going to be an, an interesting question, our, our public funding. 
Um, it, we're, we're very confident it's going to get us uh, through April and into May, but maybe not through May. Um, the city of Aspen, uh, of course, has um, um, appropriated a, a, a large sum, but it's for a lot of buckets. They're looking at both short-term and long-term uh, recovery strategies, but um, they're looking at partnership with the county uh, in terms of continuing to provide aid, uh, emergency assistance uh, to, to uh, those who are employed uh, in Picking County. Uh, particularly Aspen. Snowmass, as you know, has, has recently stepped up. And probably most excitingly, you probably read in the paper that um, really private donations are, are really starting to pick up. And they're not necessarily dedicated um, to, to what we're doing here, but dedicated to providing relief um, to folks who are out of work and, and to the nonprofits serving. And uh, we're, we're exploring... Uh, partnerships there. We're just really lucky to live in a community um, where um, a, a number of individuals on their own initiative um, are, are making these types of contributions. We have been contacted by uh, some donors who do plan to uh, donate uh, specifically for the purpose of the emergency cash assistance that, that we're providing. Um, more to come on that. We're going to be excited to, to give those folks uh, some credit um, and some well-deserved thank yous. Um, hey John. I'm trying to get through a lot quickly, yeah. Just on to finish up on the comments, one thing we could say and we could promote publicly is that uh, after reading that article, I know some of those donors received personal calls for help from the community um, and that's, that's not how they wanted to structure this. They're hoping to focus their efforts on fundraising and direct the money toward nonprofits and others who can distribute the funds in an equitable fashion. So I'd encourage the public not to look them up in the phone book and call them up and, and tell them their story. You know, we're all kind of in this together. We need to give them some space to go and raise the money that then they can focus through our uh, the structure that we've established. So yeah, don't call them. Thanks. Um, also, in, in the papers, um, we are establishing some facilities for our homeless community, uh, both in terms of camp and also um, shelter for those who may need it um, if they are symptomatic and, and need to be in isolation. Um, we're, we're working um, on, on both of those and have solutions that uh, should be in place this week. Um, so more more to come on that. Um, I think I will stop there. I know you all have questions because we usually spend about an hour um, on this part of the agenda. Kelly? I'll just report out a little bit following up on the funding um, discussion. So, um, there's sort of two tabs right now that I'm working on that I wanted to update you on. One has to do with our TANIS fund, so that's the temporary assistance for needy families. Um, Sam and Nan and Sam had reached out to me about getting some activity going and commitment from our legislatures on accessing the state reserve around TANIS. So there's 70 to $80 million in the state's TANIS reserve. And the request is to get that money to counties because ordinarily, um, you know, Picking County would go through our allocation and then buy allocation from other counties, but all other counties are using their allocation. And we expect to get through that by June at the latest for our entire year's allocation. So um, that, that effort is happening and there's um, what's called the Works Allocation Committee which is predominantly made up of county commissioners that will recommend to the JBC um, how much money to come out of the reserve and for what purposes. Um, so I want to let you know about that. And then I also want to follow up on the CARES Act letter. Um, so the CARES Act, this is the $2.2 trillion that in um, federal funding. This is sometimes referred to as the third stimulus bill that Congress passed. And 
that money um, will go, so communities of 500,000 and greater can apply directly for that money. Communities smaller than that, that money will go through to the state and then get passed along to communities maybe. Um, there's no requirement in the bill that that comes to local communities, even though that was the intent of Congress and our, our senators have written to Treasury re-expressing that, that intent to come to local communities. And that would um, to hopefully reimburse us for our recovery um, monies and also lost revenue. So our partners in the Marine Fork Valley wanted to get a letter out quickly to, um, it's up here on the board, so to the governor and other state heads involved with our emergency response asking that that they make sure that that money passed through to our local communities and also demonstrating what we expect our uh, revenue losses to look like for the remainder of 2020. So that will come from us and Snowmass, Basalt, City of Aspen, um, and Eagle County. And then separately, interest grew in the same sort of request of Governor Polis to make sure that money gets sent down to smaller communities, less than 500,000 people. And CCAT and CCI have taken an interest in that. The difference in that letter is that we're making specific requests of the governor. One, to say, please reimburse all of these qualified expenses. And please also send money based on our economic losses. And working with John Peacock, who recommended that we look at job loss from end year 2019 to quarter to 2020 so that the communities who are taking the biggest impact will get the biggest access to that portion of the fund while also rewarding communities such as ours that made really strong public health decisions early that shut down our economy. Um, so that's part two of that letter. And then part three finally is just asking the governors to identify a single point of contact for local communities to work with on getting that money sent down to us. Um, so that's, that's outstanding. We'll see how that goes. Um, there's some other things in play. And then those recommendations will also help Senator, um, you know, our, our con congressional leaders on formulating the fourth package with ideas on how they could get money directly to local communities as well. Right, I just read the letter. Okay. It was well done. All right. Thanks, Kelly. Well, Right. Uh, thank you, thank you. You're raising your hand or give, doing thumbs up? Thumbs up. Okay. George? Yeah, thanks. A couple of things, John. Um, now that we have tests, uh, we've got the antibody tests in place, uh, we have a thousand of those. Uh, do we have a, a backup order going in or are we waiting to see how these are going to perform? Yeah, George, so we were actually talking about that um, yesterday. So we've got um, a, a task force that's uh, put together that includes our epidemiologists, our logistics, and the, the medical advisory team. And so before we place an order, part of the process that we're going through before we roll out um, the more community-based testing is still doing validation um, with with this test, both with the hospital, um, and we're we're going to be doing some sampling um, with with our our pre a, a similar popula population to our, our previous round of testing, just to correlate uh, results with the PCR test and the antibody test. We really want to complete that um, kind of local study. Um, but before we order uh, more of these these tests, so we we are um, continually uh, looking at new testing opportunities that that come out. Um, I think if uh, the the correlation between the the current PCR the swab tests and the the antibody tests um, are are good, basically, we'll probably look at uh, placing additional order. Um, for, for these tests. But I, I think big picture, are we going to be ordering more tests? Absolutely. Um, we, we still need to, just like every other community, um, as we um, particularly 
look to, to unwind uh, the social distancing restrictions and picking counties are strict, really strict. Um, we want to have testing in place to understand what the impact of that uh, unwind is. So we will be ordering more tests. Um, we're not prepared to say whether it's going to be these uh, antibody tests uh, or, or if uh, another testing option is going to come along that fits better. And then uh, two other things. The, uh, the IMT, they'll be coming out with um, uh, some information in terms of who will be tested, who will be utilizing these uh, first thousand tests. Yeah, so that same um, group that I talked about with the uh, epidemiologists, the medical advisory team, and then our, our incident management team really working on logistics. Um, both are, are validating, but they're also um, putting together the, the testing plan, which is the, the who, you know, mm -hmm. the where, um, when, and how. Uh, basically of testing, they're anticipating uh, having that uh, by Friday. Oh, great. Uh, the other, the last question I have, and this may be a, a short discussion or longer discussion is, uh, the Board of Health is having a, a, a larger meeting on Thursday. It's going to be open for public uh, input, I understand. Uh, should we as the BLCC be providing some of our issues or concerns ahead uh, for the BOH to be discussing? So I think they're going to be reviewing um, public comments. So if the board, you know, you're, you're a little bit unique as a board in that you have members on the, the Board of Health. Um, and so if there are specific kind of um, positions or questions it may be worth spending a few minutes uh, during open discussion, just like we did with the RASTA board um, mm -hmm. conversation, George, that, that may be a little bit better model. Um, but yeah, they're, they're gonna be, uh, there's a lot of information that's gonna be talked about in this uh, Board of Health meeting. It's a lot of background documents for review. They're, they're linked. Um, to those documents on the Board of Health agenda. Um, and then they're going to be talking about specific elements um, of the, the public health orders. So there's going to be some discussion around uh, enforcement um, and, and getting some perspectives from law enforcement officials, attorneys, um, a medical perspective, again, that medical advisory team uh, on the, the current public health orders. Um, there are a number of specific topics that have been brought up um, either by the community or, or Board of Health uh, members uh, for further discussion um, and, and looking forward, which includes construction, bike shops, landscaping, uh, restaurant pickup and outdoor seating, uh, upcoming uh, direction on golf courses, uh, cleaning services and property management, and then uh, lodging. Our public health order um, is stricter uh, than, the, than the states and it's stricter than most of our neighboring counties, particularly uh, in relation to, to gathering size, restrictions on construction and, and restrictions on lodging. And I know we're hearing a lot of, about that, uh, frankly, in the, in the community. And there's been um, a, a lot of desire for conversation. <laughs> All of these topics will be put into a context during the Board of Health meeting of what does an unwind strategy or, or a staged kind of uh, step out um, potentially look like. So that there's a context for for the board of health that may be more information than, than you wanted there no 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 that's good but i but I, i'm just curious if and when uh, we should be as a board be providing some input uh but before the board of health meets or afterwards once they've had sort of uh, had some discussions on some of these issues and topics well i'd say it's probably a yes and george if there's the 
specific concerns um, that you as uh, board, as commissioners, um, want to be sure are uh, brought forward or, or considered by the, the Board of Health. Maybe good for you guys to use some of this open discussion time mm -hmm. uh, to talk about those so that um, it, it's Kelly and Greg, right? It's uh, or no, it's Patty and Greg. It's Patty and Greg. Yeah. They're on the, the Board of Health. So I think having, you know, just some conversation so that Patty and Greg are, are aware of the, the types of issues. You can then always um, weigh in as, as the Board of Health. I don't expect that the public health order is necessarily going to be rewritten um, this, this uh, Thursday, but I think we'll be starting to get some direction. So you'll probably have more opportunities. Right. Well, I've, got, I've got a couple of issues and concerns, but I'll let some of the other board members uh, weigh in first. You can, you can go. Um, uh, yeah, I just have a concern, John. Um, Karen has sent us 14 documents to review. Um, it's quite lengthy. Uh, just so you know, that's a lot of information, like you said. But we have our airport meeting Thursday at 4 o'clock in this same room. It's imperative that the Board of Health knows that they need to be out of here at 3.30. So I don't know if you can uh, reach out to Karen and let her know that. Because I think they're going to broadcast grassroots from this room. So we need to be in here for the airport meeting um, to, to change over. So th this is a lot of information to, to go through between 1 and 3.30. But we need to keep it in that time frame. And yeah, I can take, I'll take some notes. But Greg is the main representative. And um, for some reason, the main reps get to talk a little more than the alternates. So we might want to um, just make a list for Greg to. <laughs> I, I would say yes, definitely make a list. Um, I can tell you, I, I think the Board of Health is going to be meeting more uh, yeah, they don't through live this. We already are. We've already had a special meeting. Um, we're going to see more activity on the part of the Board of Health. Um, so I think there'll be plenty of opportunities to, to weigh in and express concerns. And I would certainly invite our board to, to participate in that way. Um, I think the, the Board of Health does, is uh, engaged and and uh, happy to be involved here. So one, yes, one, the answer to that yeah, would be one yes. Of the right? things that, one of the things I'd encourage all of you to think about is um, we've been managing a lot of discrete issues, by, like the, the leash or masks or, um, you know, a, a lot of discrete issues. And we're getting to a point now where we need to pivot to the more strategic view a more policy oriented view and we're really going to need our board of health to participate at that level because if we keep managing discrete issues we will never get to the big policy discussions and that is how we're going to unwind so sorry i'll, I'll stop i know kelly you're trying to get in there sorry no worries we'll all get our, our time i think so um i guess i would say that for me, there's two separate conversations that I think would be relevant for um, Board of Health for, I guess, some input that I would like to provide, and that is um, concerns about industries that you've raised and where their activities fit in the current um, public health orders. Because they're, you know, they're the guidance, I think, in the public health orders you know, says minimum kind of essential activity to keep businesses um, a lot you know, open or keep businesses functioning. There are certain things having to do with care uh, related to safety that, you know, I think that some really good arguments have been made about, um, you know, from some of these industries about how they could fit in the current public health order. You know, for example, if a property manager is going to run plumbing so that a house, you know, continues to function, does that fit into basic safety and protection of the home? Yes. You know, if a landscaper is cleaning ditches because, you know, preventing doing that regular ordinary maintenance that we would do, um, you know, is that public safety? I think that there's some good arguments that could be made that they are and that could fit within the current public health order. You know, bike shops, I don't know why a bike shop can't function like the bookstore is where you have zero contact with anyone in the store and drop your bike off for maintenance and come back and pick it up and you pay for everything over the phone and never have any interaction with anybody. 
you know, so that those to me would be like situations that could fit into the current public health order. And again, I recognize that there's, um, you can't get into all the nitty gritty with the discrete. So I'm wondering if there's a way to look at, um, you know, sort of a different lens, like the most protective lens would allow for these type of interactions. And then as we unroll our public health orders, maybe a less stringent lens would allow these type of interactions. And then finally, you know, something staged before opening as a whole, just different criteria that would be met um, might just be an approach for the Board of Health to take so that every activity can, can figure out which bucket they fall into. Um, so so there's, those are my two divisions of the conversation and certain things that I think could be debated about how they uh, function under the current public health order and then different approaches on how we unroll these. Okay, got it. And, uh, George. Yeah, uh, thanks, Kelly. I, I, I agree with, with uh, um, your point. Uh, John, back to you in terms of um, what we should be looking at in terms of policy decisions, overall policy. So uh, when you look at um, Kelly's example, bike shops, uh, similar to bookstores, similar to other, um, other opportunities uh, for retail, liquor stores, pot shops. I mean, you know, how, how do we consider the, them essential, but they're able to operate because of their ability to follow social distancing and limiting the number of people coming in or, or picking up outside the door. And so the, the, that's sort of a policy issue we should be looking at that should be consistent, broad-based and not uh, looking at one particular uh, type of shop over another type of shop, but all these shops, if they're going to be allowed to be open because they're considered essential, uh, they should be on the same guidelines and same rules. And I think that may make some of these conversations a little bit easier. Got it. So that that's kind of uh, similar to the discussion of the letter I sent to the, uh, this morning about the the one the woman who was going to clean a house in Snowmass Village where nobody was staying in the house she was traveling alone to go there it would have been perfectly safe for her to be cleaning the house I don't know what kind of cleaning if it was just routine maintenance maybe she was doing deep cleaning and um, sterile, you know, disinfecting it from uh, potential virus infection. We don't really know the specifics. But I think, I think, it, it, John Peacock, isn't that allowed under the ordin under the mandate? I thought uh, housekeeping opportunities were still allowed. It, it's qualified, Patty, and I need to. To, to get in um, to the language. I think big picture, guys, it would be great if we could just monitor and approve everyone uh, based on social distancing kind of adherence, but we can't. And so we have had to make um, certain calls um, uh, around activity. And the whole idea is to reduce the amount of travel and the, reduce the amount of uh, opportunities for for overall uh, interactions. Um, there there is allowance for um, folks, you know, um, doing property maintenance. You know, if something's going on with plumbing, or folks need to go through a, a property to, um, uh, you know, check the fire alarms. You know, keep keep the property at a at a minimum level of maintenance. Those sorts of things are allowed. Uh, under the, the public health order. We, we're certainly not into creating uh, unsafe conditions or, or allowing um, for deterioration, but we're certainly trying to limit um, all of the discretionary activities that lead to points of contact, whether it be um, you know at the, at the landfill or having painters in your house or um, those 
those more discretionary uh, types of projects. And so um, we, we have been pretty strict um, with the, the public health orders. Um, but necessary services, I think, Patty, to, to your point, um, for, for cleaning and sterilization and that sort of thing are, are allowed, but we are not giving generally um, permission for house cleaning services necessarily continue because that can have a lot of points of interaction. Okay, so we need to clarify that. Okay, um, the, the other point of the letter that Walt, Walt Subert had sent had to do with the landfill and he felt that it should be, he, con he considered it an essential public function and that the public should be allowed to go there during, during the hours when the landfill is open. But he felt like uh, we needed to take steps to protect the employee at the scale house and do things, do whatever, you know, the social distancing thing is important. And is there a way to to uh, enforce the social distancing, I think it partly would have to do, if we were doing that, we would just have to only let a certain number of people into the landfill at one time to unload their recycling or their trash. Uh, so what's your thoughts on that, John? Uh Honestly, Steve, um, you know, we, we've reopened for limited amounts of time. Most people are calling ahead uh, to, to understand what's allowed and what's not. We are still, um, right now, not necessarily accepting, like, construction mm -hmm. uh, debris and those sorts of things. We're really limiting it to making sure people can get trash and recycling um, out of their house. That is really... The, the essential service from a, a public health perspective. Um, we, we still have, we have had fewer people um, either calling or, or upset about that recently. Uh, obviously, when you first do it, um, communications never get to everyone. Um, we wish they did, um, but, but they don't. Um, you know, I, I would suggest for the duration of the public health or if you open it back up, we're going to have all those little construction projects. We're going to have all of those little, and as soon as we start turning them around, um, if, if that's the order, people are going to, um, we're, we're either encouraging those types of activities or people get angry and they are interfacing with our staff um, in, in not always so calm or appropriately social distanced ways. And so um, our, our recommendation um, I know it's difficult. All of this is difficult. None of these have been easy um, or, or fun decisions to have to make, and they're even worse on the other side of those decisions for the people impacted by them. Uh, we've been doing this for a week, though, now, and I, I would encourage the board to let it run concurrent with the public health order, or I think you're encouraging activities that aren't consistent with it. Okay. Steve had an uh, idea. That's, that's my recommendation. It's your call, though. Okay, Patty. Well, Steve had an idea, though. Um, I don't know. I, I think there's still some people that are coming to the window and interfacing directly with staff. Um, and I don't know if we've done what some of those stores have done is hang a piece of plexiglass. So there's a separation. Um, I think we should probably do that uh, just in case. People come up and they're angry and they are in, in you know that employee space. I think we need to have some protection there, and it's a pretty simple thing to you know get a piece of plexiglass, drill some holes, and hang it from the ceiling. So can we maybe look into that? We're not letting people in the scale house right now. It's really we've got to be able to move that plexiglass to conduct transactions right now. That's, no, you that's just hang our, it at this distance. We've got a window. Well, okay. It's just it's they're they're using them all over town, everywhere you go, and the transactions occur underneath. Um, yeah, it's just I mean, it's just a protective layer. It's it's just another layer of protection because people still go but up I, there and knock on. You know, you just never know. If if you're gonna reopen though, you're you're still encouraging activities that we're trying to discourage. I'm not you saying know, that we're gonna reopen. I think. Oh, we're I'm doing, sorry. Okay, no. Patty. But sorry, if when we get to that point, we still may want to do that to be protective. Yeah. Understood. Got it. 
just for it's for really for the safety of the employee there to give them a little extra layer of protection it could be even from a you know one of the waste management driver or you know trash hauler with their going over the scale maybe he has to talk to the person at the scale I don't know if, I don't know if they actually talk to each other because they know the trucks coming in they weigh them and uh, the the driver doesn't have to pay or do something they just record that company how much it that load weighs and um, the commercial is definitely easier from that regard and mm -hmm. and then we also are not having interactions on the um, household waste and recycling right now but if you open it back up um, particularly if we follow those same protocols you're gonna have a lot of people coming in so I think part of part of the issue was the communication issue because a lot of people aren't reading the newspaper and they you know they were getting the message that they couldn't go to the landfill when they showed up at the landfill and um, that was the first they knew about it so and it's difficult when people aren't reading the paper so much and if they don't call ahead uh, I'm sure there's probably are still people out there who don't realize there are some rules in place and how do you reach the, those kind of people George yeah I'm, I'm, I'm also hoping that I don't know if it's on the Board of Health agenda that you mentioned John but as we talk about recovery because hopefully um, by the the end of this month in two weeks we could start phasing back in some some of these services and businesses and if if we have an idea of how that phasing will be and if there's any sort of priorities that will happen that may lower the temperature within the community as well knowing that it, it's it's short-lived and we've got a, a tentative plan that that's going to be in place to start this recovery effort and bringing back uh, businesses and services into our community again and so that that is going to be part of the discussion george on thursday i, I certainly don't want to get ahead of the the public health experts and the, the public health board um, but i will tell you that um you know they're they're going to be talking from a policy perspective about mm -hmm. kind of the stages um that that you re-enter and reintroduce activity um how how those stages look in terms of um, business activity as well as group size and um, also the metrics that that we'll be looking at and on the flip side what do we need to have in place from a public health perspective um, to, to really monitor and and protect and so it's going to be the kind of that balance balance point so all of that is going to be talked about and we're going to be getting some guidance so what one other quick one other quick thing and then i'll be done um again looking at um bike shops uh in terms of policy consistency within a community the ability to utilize um an amenity that provides not only physical relief but certainly emotional and mental relief to be able to go out and ride a bike uh, but another anecdote that i saw in the paper a letter to the editor uh, with someone who was walking their dog on the Aspen golf course and was told he couldn't walk their dog on the golf course. Now the golf course is, is open space, it's public open space. It's, it's got nothing to do with whether the golf course should be open to the public in terms of golfing uh, versus just the ability to walk on open space. So that again, I think is sort of a policy decision where people can go yeah, I don't think that that had anything to do with the public health order on, on the golf no, course. No, I, oh, no, oh, okay. I think, and I think, it, I think there was some confusion. I don't know who this person was uh, stopped by. There was a city employee, a golf course employee, saying that um, the golf course is closed, so you're not allowed to walk on it. So, again, there's a lot of mixed messages out there in terms of where one can go, what one can do. And if the Board of Health can help to clarify that, I think that would be great. Kelly? Thanks. 
Yeah, I want to go back to just what John was talking about, about kind of um, down the public health orders. You know, one of the things that I've been thinking about in terms of how do we look at some of these policies and maybe make recommendations to the Board of Health or, or suggestions to the Board of Health is, you know, how many additional contacts does an activity generate? Um, so, you know, for me, like, like the bike shop thing, I sort of feel like that can kind of fall under how we're treating retail right now, and maybe the Board of Health can consider that. But then when I think landscaping, you know, again, if there's safety, can, if there's direct safety correlations with what landscaping work has to be done, great. But there also has to be a consideration of like what's then done with the material produced by the landscaper. You know, we have our, land, our landfills closed, right? So there needs to be some reconciliation of that, of that if, if we're going to open up that activity, then there's an additional contact that comes along with it. You know, that landfill comes along with it. Or like with construction, you know, yes, I took, you know, on one <laughs> hand, I could myself and say, yeah, small construction projects, if you're a single construction worker in a house, What's the big deal? But on the other hand, we know then then that's just going to generate more visits to retail stores, right? For to buy supplies and things like that. And so again, generating another contact, which is some of the things that we're trying to avoid. So I guess I would just ask that the public health in considering these step down, <laughs> um, <laughs> step down process, you know include that in like that element of how many additional contacts is this activity or this you know grouping of activities going to generate and you know maybe we do fewer first and then more later on down the line as we're able to sort of track what the flow opening up is doing to exposing our community to more virus or not kelly was that a public display of affection there <laughs> yes, it was. Yeah. My, my daughter, she just woke up. I oh, wanted good. to say hi. <laughs> so, Kelly, you're quite the TV celebrity right now. I'm looking at five pictures of you on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if your daughter can't see all that many. <laughs> uh, let's see, more comments? Uh, I was just going to weigh in. Um, I think that we hear you, and I think uh, Patty and I can certainly take these concerns to the Board of Health. Those are the big questions. How do you create a uniform and equitable uh, system of rules, and then how do you ramp it back? Um, you know, a bike shop might be incredibly essential to one person while it's not to another, as with the con you know, construction. So it really is an issue, and, and as you pointed out, Kelly, Anytime you create a new activity, you're creating a chain of activities that, that could lead uh, back to uh, the opportunity to spread. Um, so, so I think the Board of Health is paying attention to that, and our advisors certainly are. Uh, so it's going to be an interesting conversation, but I'm, I'm eager to take this information that you've all contributed to them, um, as Patty would be as well. And I'm, I'm sure if anything else comes up and you want to bring it up with us, please do. And I, as I said before, I think we're going to have more more opportunities to weigh in with the Board of Health as they become more active on this whole thing going forward. If I could add, there's going to be you know one more potential level of, of complication. All of this is as a region, um, how do we stay coordinated as we come out? We we're very well coordinated going in, and and I still think. The, the vast majority, super majority of our public health orders are, are the same, but then each community had um, incremental, sometimes significantly incremental uh, differences in, in tightening down light construction and lodging and uh, a number of the things that, that we're talking about that, that Picking County did and our neighbors. And so as we come back out, um, I think another consideration for everyone is how do we get a line to reduce that confusion since we operate as a valley uh, to, to a large degree. That will probably be another consideration for everyone. Okay, Patty? Well, and John, I want to add to that in following the, the national news, um, I don't know how far this will go, but the president's 
new stance that he has the control, and if he wants to open up the country, it's not up to the individual governors in the state. So I'm not sure how that's going to play out, but it's something I think we really need to keep an eye on um, because chances are we will be in the process of getting ready. We may not be ready. Um, And it's interesting that it – I think it's just something we need to follow, just keep our eye on. I I can say your staff does not agree uh, with that (laughs) analysis, and I think there's a lot of folks who don't, and you guys need to do what's best for this community. Well, yeah, Anna, I think that the fact is it's always been my understanding as long as we are doing something, we aren't doing less than other mandates like the state or the feds, we're actually doing more, and that's that's our purview. But the president is now saying, no, it's really up to him. So I don't, you know, he says a lot of things, but you just never know, and I think we just need to keep an eye on it, if if that's possible. Kelly? Yeah, and I just, you know, I just would like to comment, I mean, that... I'm also really interested in what the medical team's um, recommendations will be in, you know, coming down the line about how we manage opening our community up beyond just the valley. So, you know, we've we've started this crisis with due to an international tourism economy, and how do we get back to that while, you know, staging it in a way to protect people and manage any future spread. And, you know, those are going to be some of the policy decisions that that come back to this board um, because a lot of it, I think, um, is going to come back to what is our capacity to do contact tracing, do isolation, quarantine, testing. You know, a, a lot of that we've accomplished through really strict public health orders to a large degree at the expense of our economy. So as we bring our economy back, how do we establish metrics for what that capacity needs to be? And then how are we going to support and fund it? Um, <laughs> that those are going to be big policy decisions coming back to you guys and how that uh, step out eventually works, I think is going to um, define, we, it's a little bit of a chicken in the egg, right? We, we've got to know what the step out looks like and then um, match up capacity to that. And I think it's particularly difficult and I've talked to my peers in, in a number of resort uh, communities now, and we're going to try and get together on a more regular basis, both in Colorado and, and Utah. We are all struggling with that exact question, how do you answer it? So uh, we're working on it, and I wish I had a great answer for you right now, but I don't. Yeah, I think it's almost certain that there will be flare-ups <coughs> of the virus moving forward in next fall or winter there could be a major explosion of it again in in some communities in the state or the country Um, and how are we going to react to those when they happen especially given that if we have the tourist economy starting to operate again here and people are traveling here again coming from places where there might be flare-ups we very well might have to lock it down again. Um, That would be worst case scenario, but being realistic, that could happen again. And how are we gonna deal with it? How are we gonna deal with that when it happens? Um, Steve, on the flip side of that, if we don't have a good plan in place, if we can't assure visitors that Mm -hmm. um, we have a way to manage this, people may not want to come back yeah. um, in, in the same number. So there's there's two sides. I mean, there's a flip side to that that we've got to take into consideration and figure out. Mm-hmm. Greg? Um, I was just going to say this is a problem that's global, nationwide, and, and throughout the tourism industry. Um, everyone is asking these questions. So I think we're going to have a, a robust national discussion on this that we can participate in and and glean some information in. Uh, We're seeing how the industry is changing. For instance, um, I've been watching what uh, Disney, for instance, just runs lots of people through, and they're trying to figure out how can they safely manage the hordes of people that go to Disneyland and Disney World. And uh, I know they're talking about doing temperature sensing. Uh, They're they're talking about other measures, distancing things that might become the new normal going forward. Um, and I think the, the fortunate thing is, is we have the rest of the world doing this. They're in the same boat with us. 
uh, I did want to ask, um, it seems to me that I, I keep hearing about contact tracing being such an important part of it. And I'm wondering, um, do we know what it takes to staff up on contact tracing? It sounds like it's a pretty labor intensive thing. Um, can we train people to do that? Could I learn how to do it? Or is this uh, something that requires a degree in public health? Just a, that's a, a question I'd have for the Board of Health or for maybe you know, IMT experts. Yeah, it definitely requires some epidemiological um, knowledge. Uh, we and I think some public health knowledge to, to do well, Greg. Um, but those are all the types of questions that, that we're gonna be asking because epidemiologists have all of a sudden become a very short supply. And so how do we um, accomplish what we need to um, with using folks who may have a, a corresponding skill set uh, in, in terms of investigation and asking questions? And that sort of thing. So it, it certainly underscores it underscores the need for a national co cogent policy for, on things like this. You know, leaving it to the states separately isn't going to do it. If if we're following the rules or following a stringent rule, and our neighbors aren't, that's not doing us much good. But hopefully, we can you know help stay on the front of this and in, encourage others to be just as serious about it as we've been. Okay, George. Um, and uh, if we're all done with this topic, I just wonder for the public viewing, uh, we want to just remind people, uh, and if there's any discussion that's needed with our upcoming uh, report from the Vision Committee for the uh, for the Aspen Airport, which will be uh, coming up on Thursday, this Thursday at four o'clock. Is, is there anything that needs to be discussed? Regarding that, John, in terms of the process, <coughs> oops. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. I was having trouble getting my cursor over my mute button, um, and that was a shoot uh, that I said, by the way. Um, <laughs> So uh, just just to note that um, the meeting will be from uh, it, it's set up as a work session, so it is not set up um, for this board to to take uh, any action on the report or the recommendations. It's really an opportunity uh, for the vision committee um, to hand over the work that they've done over the last gosh 15, 16 uh, months now um, the way it will be structured is there will be a presentation um, by the vision committee leadership so it's going to be john bennett meg haynes and jackie francis there is one minority report um, that that will be uh, presented and then there will be um, basically an opportunity for the the board and vision other vision committee members um, to, to weigh in. This is really the transmittal of, of their recommendations as they stand uh, right now to you. Um, as you'll see, part of their recommendations, uh, you know, include some, some additional check-ins uh, uh, along the way. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll eventually be getting some guidance from you on that. But this is really an opportunity for them to conclude this stage of their, their work. Great, thanks. And I will be participating from here. I don't know who else is planning, but we have to uh, make sure we only have five people in the room. Yeah, we had discussion. I, I guess I'll be in touch with you, John, to see who who's going to be in the room. How many would we have? Um, I would like to be here if I could to be chair, but if I do it from home or from upstairs in the office, I'd be, you know, that that would be all right too. Sure. Well, <clears throat> and remember, we have the Roaring Fork room where we can push audio and video. Um, we could have up to, to four members, depending on people's comfort level with technology. Um, so we may use the Roaring Fork room in the lobby and, and bring people in and out uh, to speak, depending on how many commissioners are there. So um, we're working on those logistics, and uh, 
More to come. Great. Okay. Greg? Uh, I, I picked up my thick folder so long ago now, I can't even remember how long, it's been a few weeks now, and I'm just wondering, is, are there more packet materials printed out and waiting for us that I should come in and pick up? Uh, printed out, no. Um, distributed with the, the packet, the final vision committee report and appendices. Uh, would be the addition and, and those you should have electronically now yeah that's okay great and that's, and that's in the public packet as well that's the one the public site yeah yeah there's nothing that that yeah that's 68 pages the packet that's on it's posted on the picking county website for the presentation thursday okay i'm looking around the room to see if anyone else wants to comment <laughs> Is everybody good for good. good for today? I'll just uh, say thank you again for your guys' leadership. I know these I are have something. Uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> Kelsey, I thought you were waving. I thought you were waving goodbye. I just wanted to check in with the other board members to see if you saw Pat Bingham's invitation to do like a connect with commissioners. You would have. Um, she linked you to the video that Greg and I did over the weekend, and you know. I know I'm eager and maybe others are eager to just be more present and a place of accountability around our COVID response um, for the community. And so um, I wanted to make sure you guys saw that and, you know, you can communicate with Pat about your interest level um, or, you know, it can be Kelly and Greg. You know, so. so we are, Pat and I are planning something for tomorrow would be revolving around the the homeless camp at uh, Brush Creek Park and Ride is what we're planning. So look forward to that. Okay, anything further? I'll just John. I'll just finish by thank you for your leadership. These are challenging times. The um, we're trying to do some normal business and some business we wouldn't normally be doing, and appreciate. Um, your flexibility and, and understanding uh, as, as we work through a lot of new stuff. So thank you guys. Yeah, thank you too, John. Thanks all of, to all of you. Okay, well, we'll call this meeting over for the work session on April 14th. And we'll see everybody on Thursday at 4. You got it. Some of you will see each other before then for the Board of Health meeting. Bye.